And welcome back again to another of your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast. Thought Right Podcast. My name's Brendan. And I'm Malia. Welcome to the show. Yes. Back again. A little bit more bruised, a uh, little bit more broken, but ready for a good show. Um, bruised and broken. <laughs> Yes, I guess we'll go into our axiom and then I'll give a little bit of a story uh, behind it. So um, we commit to being honest, intelligent, unscripted and bringing interesting conversations and information we get and following it to wherever it leads, holding nothing back and sharing brutal honesty the entire time because we censor nothing and talk about everything. Yay. So this week we had to cancel two of our true crime talk shows um, because while I was away, flown out to an undisclosed location, uh, I got horribly, horribly, horribly sick. Like one of the top three worst sicks I've ever had. And uh, I had a fever so high that I was hallucinating and it left like a fever rash on me. I don't know. The idea of like my fever was so high that like my skin was boiling is kind of a weird thing to think about. But that's essentially what happened. Well, I I didn't get beat up and I didn't get my my neck attempted to be cut in the field or anything like that. Uh but that would be a cooler story. This just isn't that. Didn't they tell you not to drink the water in Mexico? I know, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, what I think actually happens when you get a fever rash is it's kind of like a heat rash. Like the sweat and stuff gets clogged. Like it can't come out. I don't think I And it gets sweat. it bubbles under the skin. I don't think I sweat when I'm fevering. I'm like shivering. The sweat comes after. Once my fever yeah, breaks, yeah. But did that I'm like, start? Did the rash start before or after? I was too sick to know. I don't know. Mm. I didn't even know where I was. I was hallucinating. I had all kinds of crazy hallucinations. Do you hallucinate every time you get sick? No, <laughs> no. It kind of seems like it. <laughs> no, there's just been a couple times that have have given me a really high fever, and uh, I just had some crazy hallucinations and like i just remember being super uncomfortable i don't remember those days but i just remember being uncomfortable like it gave me anxiety and i remember one of them i was like a ceo in the hallucination and like i had to fix this problem that the company had and like i kept coming up with really great ideas over and over and over like one idea no, it doesn't work because of this. Okay, here's another idea. No, it doesn't work because of this. Here's another idea. And I went through that process of coming up with a new idea that failed like a hundred times. And like I was, my optimism was like, okay, I even if I fail 10,000 times, I only have to succeed once, you know? But that one time just would never come in my hallucination. Well, were you on like the verge of death and your body was trying to... <laughs> I don't know. Keep you busy. I have no idea. To keep you fighting to be alive. I don't know. I'm not sure. But anyway, really weird. That's why I'm all wrapped up here. That's why it looks like I got beat up on my nose. Uh, But uh, welcome to the show, everyone. Make sure you do all the podcast things. Hit all the podcast buttons. Check out all the podcast social media. Everything from Discord, which you need an invite to, and you can find flying across now. Uh, Our Twitter, aka X, TikTok, Patreon, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, the whole works. So when you're on there, check us out. Hit that like button. Hit the those thumbs up buttons. Uh, give us a comment. Give us a rating. Send us some love. And we appreciate it. Yes. Indeed. Well, what about uh, the True Crime Talk Show? Yeah. So we go live on the True Crime Talk Show on Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. YouTube's mainly where the chat is at. Um, every Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, except for when Brendan's dying. 
um, from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central Time. Well, actually, we've changed it up now, so probably should say this. Um, we're now doing it from 9 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, and then from 10.30 to 11, 11.30-ish, we are doing members only every time. Yep. Yep, absolutely. So if you are, uh, you know, a paying member on YouTube, then you get that's where we're like really gonna just interact with the chat, just just talk to the chat, yeah, yeah. you know, only get more <laughs> personal. See, and I guess I'll give a rundown on why too, because we have a we have a handful, quite a few people who love to chat and will chat literally the entire true crime talk show, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with it, uh, but in comparison point for point, you know, metric for metric, uh, there are more people who don't chat. And quite a few people have reached out to us and we're like, hey, we just want to let you know that we watch everything you do from start to finish. Uh, the one thing that's hard to watch, though, is uh, when you guys are interacting with the chat so much. We love what you're saying. We love the thought provoking conversation. So, we had to find a middle ground to where we can keep everyone happy. You know what I mean? And one of the areas I feel like we are lacking in is uh, doing something for our members. So this way, the people who are on there and love chatting, most of them are members anyways, uh, get that experience at the same time. While we also have the experience where we're like focused on the topic and the think tank and the ideas and and really digging in. And I think it's a good setup. I think it's a winning setup. I think it'll be good. Yeah. And um, obviously during the true crime talk show, like people who leave a super chat or something or like we wouldn't want to leave that hanging. So we'll definitely shout those out. But main, no, it no. makes it easier when people are rewatching the true crime talk show it flows better you know it just works better for viewing it yep if you're if you're not involved in the chat then i could imagine it would be pretty hard to watch if yeah. somebody's sitting there just talking to the chat the whole time it would no, get boring get really quick so we want to keep up the quality of the show um so yeah that i mean the members only is going to be a good time so yeah. you should definitely check it out Absolutely. i have fun sitting there just talking to the chat yeah, I do too. Absolutely. I have fun doing both things. I love thinking and I love think tanking and I like being able to think out loud and things like that too. So oh, yeah, we should call think, the members only the think tank. Yeah. The thought right think tank. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. So we will continue making changes and, uh, you know, positive changes. I, I'm sure we'll make changes that don't always work. I feel like this is one that's going to work. Um, uh, because, you know, this is the people's podcast. We do what you guys want and provide for you guys. So, yeah. But uh, anyways, just one more reminder. Please make sure you hit that like and thumbs up button. And please leave a comment under the video, okay? Uh, it, the, the comment does so much, you guys. So even if it's one comment, you find something that was interesting in the show, and you let us know, hey, you guys, uh, I really liked this topic, or I really liked this angle. That is phenomenal. It doesn't Even if you stop by and say hi, you know, we have dedicated watchers, um, thought writers that will leave a comment in every video and just you know, leave like an emote, you know, we have this one person out there, uh, which I won't put their name on blast or anything like that, but they leave this one emote every time. And I look for it on every video. It's awesome. So, uh, you know, that's support that that person is supporting us because these platforms look for that engagement. So, right. um, yeah, just, if you get a second, we would really appreciate it a ton more than, you know, so, uh, you're awesome and we appreciate you. Um, and then tonight's show, because I'm still recovering, I'm sure you could probably hear it a little bit. Uh, I'm on, you know, loads of Dayquil, ibuprofen and everything else recouping from this um, attempted hit. I mean, sickness. Uh, <laughs> and um, 
We are doing a little bit of a reduced show this week, and hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be back to normal for next week, you guys. But we didn't want to leave you hanging. We figured if we just did a couple less stories, we could get it done in a shorter amount of time, uh, but maybe be able to dig in a little bit more. So we will get right into it here. So we are digging into the Thought Riot podcast, breaking news of the week. And just a reminder, the breaking news doesn't, what our breaking news topics are, are a mix between topics that are not being researched into. So essentially, if we have an update to one of our cases, like we've got this new piece of information, that could be in the breaking news. If there is a breaking news story, a crime news story that's just launching, there aren't many details out. Uh, there's not much to investigate. It'll be in there. Um, there, we also have uh, like updates to our viewers and things like that. Well, we're, we'll where we will do it in a breaking news topic, also. So, um, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, not heavily researched information. Yep, yep. So, number one, this is one of those like non-crime focused breaking news. I think this one's interesting though. So. Update or breaking news number one uh, is the CW Network, Crime Nation, all right? And Crime Nation is the CW Network's inaugural true crime and justice anthology series aims to immerse viewers in the world of real-life mysteries, cold cases, and intense investigations. And they have a new episode about Delphi. Mm-hmm. I that, watched it. Yes, I I knew you watched it. I I haven't watched it. So essentially, I'll have you talk on it here. Uh, but it says in in just one episode, the series will explore the the tr the tragic ending of young teens Abby Williams and Libby German in Delphi, Indiana, on February thirteenth, twenty seventeen. Uh, despite pleas from authorities, the case remains unsolved, fueling a devi divisive social media frenzy that continues to haunt the community six years later. And that's what I pulled off the internet. So what, what did you think about it in general without giving too much? Right. Yeah. Without giving too many spoilers. I, I think there's some parts of it missing. Like I think there's certain things I would have liked to have seen talked about more, but overall I was happy with it. Um, I really liked seeing interviews um, from people who knew Abby and Libby that you don't typically see, um, you know, people that grew up with them, that kind of thing. Oh, like, that's wow, nice yeah. to see stuff like that. Yeah. People from the town who were, you know, kids at the time they were kids that share their experience and who Abby and Libby were to them. Yeah. Um. That's one thing we've highlighted and especially just recently uh, coming, you know, just on the other side of the anniversary is uh, the fact that this is one of those cases that is very easily at this point, you lose the focus of the victims that started all of this and that everyone's yeah. fighting for justice. The for. court circus and not to mention all the drama between so many people, which is it also highlights in this documentary um, so much. I, I am not saying speculation is bad, okay, as as a whole. Like, I'm not putting it in a box and saying it's all bad because, you know, Nancy Grace did a, a video on it and uh, she thought it was horrible that they that there was a lot of speculation going around about the case and that it hurts the case. But the thing is, is Nancy Grace speculates on her show all the time. And it could be some of her speculations could potentially be very harmful to the defense of a defendant, especially if they're innocent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so and I, I mean, we all want a fair trial here. We want justice for Abby and Libby. Um, and I do feel like there were missteps in the investigation. And I think most people feel that way, actually. Yeah. Um, most people absolutely feel that way, whether you think Richard Allen is guilty or innocent. Um, there were some missteps. Yeah. Um, and there have even been officers themselves that have said they didn't know what they were doing. 
they started training after the crime. So, I mean, it's a good watch. Um, I suggest anyone interested in the Delphi case, if you want to kind of go back to the beginning a little bit, they did focus in on one alternate suspect. Um, I would have liked to, I mean, I guess there were some about others too that, you know, are big names in the case. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. Um, I There was some stuff in there that I definitely want to dig deeper into and uh, compare and contrast with other information. Because, um, you know, we felt like Bridge Guy all along was Ron Logan. We have felt that way. The stature of that man. Um, you know, we saw the knee injury, the knee injury, or a weird walk. I mean, I never got confirmation yeah. he had a knee injury, but whoever walked on the bridge and then when we saw him walking, same knee, same give. He walks same. the same yeah. way. Um, and I mean, again, the stature, the hat, like there's so many things. And, you know, in the FBI documents, his phone was pinging at home when all that went down. Yeah. His yeah. alibi never checked out. Yeah. It did not. Yeah. So he had the opportunity. Now, he is pretty old. So I think that it very likely he would have needed help. But I mean, I think I there's know. definite questions with that video. I really wish they would have actually released a segment of it instead of this weird distorted part where the guy's super far away and then they literally put audio on top of it like that audio you hear is not from that part of the video that you're seeing visually mm -hmm. it's audio cut from a different part of the video and dubbed on top of a video where they took the audio off and it's just the guy walking not mm -hmm. talking yeah um so it's super confusing like yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's a way they do it to try to protect the integrity of an investigation. I don't know. I'm not no. sure. But I've never. No, but I, you cannot tell me you've ever seen that kind of thing in another case. But I mean, also, I don't, it is a rarity that you have. It was the FBI who put it out. So it I, is rare. You have a perpetrator caught on video from a victim, though. Yeah, I think that whole scene is weird. And I yes, I wish that they would have clarified. However, I'm a firm believer that, you know, during an active investigation, I don't believe the public needs to know all of these details. So to put something Agreed. a little bit confusing out there there might be some kind of intention behind it that without being in that war room uh you know we we won't know so maybe there is a reason so, to it so i think their intention behind releasing that recording was to get the public's help identifying this person mm -hmm. if you want help identifying this person why pick I mean, we know that phone did not have that bad of camera quality, which I believe means that was super zoomed in. It was so pixelated and crappy because that guy was far away when they were taking that video. Um, and isn't video quality a little worse than camera quality on phones usually? That too. Mm, not anymore, but it generally. In 2017. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I would have to go back and do some research. It's been some years now that phones have equally uh, as as good of cameras on them as most cameras. Yeah. But I mean, I just think that they could have given a better part of the video. They could have not done the whole thing with the audio like they could have made it easier for the public to help unless the intention was not to get the public's help. And there was a different motive. There, maybe, like you're saying, maybe. Well, I'm not. Saying it's just not very a helpful. Motive in like a negative space like that. I'm saying that there might be an honest motive why they needed to put it out in that way. That it, they believed that that would get the furthest, fastest because of our short attention spans of only being able to watch, you know, eight to thirteen seconds on average per person per video, which is a real statistic. Maybe they smushed it together in that way to to get it out the furthest they could. I don't know. I'm I I just have a hard time like condemning that when it's a, a really good thing to get that out to the public without knowing why is all I'm saying. Don't you think it's weird though? We have that video and it's like the worst video ever, and we have two perp sketches. 
No, I don't think it's weird because, again, I, I don't know why. That's assuming there's some kind of nefarious reasoning to that. And, and I don't know that. I do know, though, that there's no such thing as a perfect investigation, that there are always going to be flawed and or mistakes made in the investigation, completely human and normal. I know there's no such thing as a perfect crime. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I just have a hard time. And I think the Delphi case is as shady as they come right now because of how it's being managed. That doesn't mean that these, that every step was a mistake or done in a, in a negative space, you know? Yeah, I guess. So, but I'm curious what you guys think about it. If you've watched it, leave a comment below. I will, uh, probably comment on it on the true crime talk show once I, get a chance to watch it in the next few days. So um, it yeah, was interesting. Us, I liked it. Yeah. Let us know. Um. So hold on. So I saw a lot of people around the YouTube true crime community um, following the Harmony Montgomery trial uh, where her father, Adam Montgomery was, being tried for beating his daughter to death. Mm. Um, it, it's a horrible, horrible, awful case. And I watched um, a witness statement of a woman who knew him, was friends with him. I think maybe even dated him. I was a little unclear on that, where she literally said that Adam told her he hated Harmony montgomery's guts his own daughter because she reminded him of his ex her mother he hated her guts and would complain Whoa. about her okay so awful and sad um but this all happened in in new hampshire um harmony montgomery was five at the time and she they still haven't found her body to this day. So he's been convicted officially, um, found guilty of second degree murder, um, second degree assault, falsifying physical evidence, abuse of a corpse, and witness tampering. Um, but they don't have her body. How did they get him on abuse of a corpse? Well, His because admission? so I I mean, I don't I don't think he admitted to it. I know there's uh there was a lot of different witness statements from people he knew, even mm. you know, Harmony's mother and stuff. You know, she did jail time for um lying to the cops for him at first. Well and then good. she she's she was still in jail. She came in there in her oranges. Um, but I'm assuming she's now being totally, totally honest. <laughs> Because the lawyer even asked her, you know, the consequences of lying on the stand now, right? And she's like, oh, yeah, I know. I know. Um, so I don't I mm. honestly I haven't looked a ton into this case, so I don't know all of those little details of that stuff. I was more surprised because I just know the general overview. And again, this is a breaking news. Topic. Yeah. Um, that he was convicted of these things. He beat her and he hid her body in like a bag and dropped it on the side of the highway is what police believe um, somewhere off of the side of a highway. And it still has not been found. Um, and after his conviction, I saw an article from CBS News saying that they are continuing to endlessly search a 26 mile route for her body. Um, <laughs> she disappeared in 2019. Her body was never found. They didn't know she was even missing until 2021, two years later. Oh my God. Which is so, so sad. Yeah. But they say that the stepmother, Kayla Montgomery, um, said in court that Adam put Harmony's body in a bag, got a U-Haul truck from a friend to dispose of her. Mm. So I'm assuming it's not just like literally on the side of the highway. It's off in something. Why would you need a whole U-Haul truck? I, that's what I was just thinking right now is, well, if it's a child, the U-Haul, I'm a little confused by that, but okay. So yeah, I'm a little confused Could by be it too. DNA yeah. thinking or something of that nature. 
So it's bet- they believe her remains are somewhere between the 26 mile stretch between Manchester and New Hampshire, mm. the Revere Chelsea area outside of Boston. Um, so they've already taken relentless searches have already taken place in Rumney Marsh Reservation in Revere, the Sales Creek area, the Chelsea Creek area, and behind North Shore Road. Okay. But I mean interesting. It's just it's just wild that they got a conviction for to like he got convicted. Yeah. And they still don't like it feels like the case isn't actually closed because nobody's found her. Yeah, I if there's enough evidence and there's enough evidence to convict, it sounds like to me there was enough evidence to convict, uh, even if they haven't found her yet. But uh, I just hope they find her. That would just cl- put a, a lid, a finalizing lid on uh, a really unfortunate situation. Um, and, uh, you know, at least allow, I don't even know if she has family that is even considered worth caring you know it sounds like her mom knew she was gone and didn't say anything that is i mean her mom i think Mm. was scared a little bit like i think she was scared she was scared of getting people in trouble she was being lied to so from everything i've heard and again i i'm not the expert on this case i have not dug into it like i've dug into other cases but it sounds like adam is just a complete liar like he just lies endlessly yeah, two and years, i know a daughter i understand that i would if it was my kid i would be flipping out after an hour yeah right like i don't care what you're saying to me that, that that's not important i don't care if you have an excuse i don't care if you have a reason i don't care about anything but the time and where they are i mean know? like honestly if somebody i care about is missing like and i don't know where they are and i'm getting the run around it could be five minutes or less and i would be freaking out just to mm. be honest um but it sounds like he's never fessed up to anything at all um he just lies he just obfuscates you know he just he never tells the truth um and really they're just been getting the truth out of you know other people around him. Well, uh, like the stepmother and the mother away. I'm glad he's um, put away. So he doesn't cooperate at all. Um, and they, and he clearly, if he had, if he would have said something, they would know where she is. So he clearly has not. Um, but it says investigators are asking people to keep an eye out for a tan CMC hospital tote bag that Adam was carrying. Um, and if you, have seen anything suspicious in those areas call 603-932-8997 um yeah i mean i just even i mean he's the monster here Mm -hmm. even if other people involved you know didn't do what they were supposed to do i feel like he's the ultimate evil here and i think everyone deserves closure um what happened to her i i just i can't even imagine you know, like the way her own father brutalized her mm-hmm. to death is like the most tragic thing I can possibly think of. And, you know, she deserves a proper burial, if yeah. anyone, for her, you know. Yeah. Um, so I hope that they find her and finally lay her to rest for her sake and any family who still loves her and cares about her. Yeah, I agree. But that's it. If you have uh, anything specific to this case you would want us to dig into, definitely let me know. Um, like maybe looking into more of the details around where she could be or anything like that. Definitely let us know. This is just, you know, I feel like that needs to be talked about that she still hasn't been found. Yeah. I think that's a good call. All right, so for the final update for tonight, this one's a wild one. It's technically like a two-part breaking news type update. This is really strange. So one of our viewers let me onto this, which I appreciate you if you're the one who did, because this is interesting. Uh, So on on January 30th of 20, Tuesday, January 30th, 2024, David Schroitman, 27, of Somerville, was arrested 
on charges of first degree murder, possession of a weapon, tampering with physical evidence, and hindering prosecution in the death of Mary Rose Feely, who's 27 years old. Now, all right. Police responded about 10.20 p.m. January 30th to a 911 call about an unresponsive woman outside a residential complex on North Bridge Street in Somerville and discovered Feely with multiple apparent stab wounds, officials said. She was pronounced dead at the scene after life-saving efforts failed. Feely was stabbed about 37 times after arriving home from a business in Bridgewater, according to a probable cause affidavit obtained by uh, the site, a relative told cops that her front passenger door was open and her belongings were strewn across the front yard. So on uh, February 1st, police obtained a dash cam video showing a man wearing a gray sweatshirt, a black face gaiter, and thick cushioned sneakers standing around or near Feely's home around 9 p.m., the night she was killed, according to the affidavit. So, long story short, they come upon uh, David Schroitman, okay? So, the evidence leaves the, leads them to David Schroitman, and uh, they show up at Schroitman's work. He uh, denies talking to them, says, you know, sorry, I got, I got nothing to say to you. There's the door. Bye bye. Uh, they go and get a warrant and they next approach him and they approach him as he's cleaning his car in his car. He has plastic bags over all the seats. And he's cleaning his car. I found that really interesting because we're talking about the Brian Koberger car DNA stuff last week, right? And I'm going to be talking about it actually in one of my stories tonight to continue in the conversation and going a little bit of a different direction. Um, but he had plastic covering the seats and cleaning. And you know where DNA was found from the crime scene? Hmm. In his car and his home. And he stabbed one victim a comparable amount of times as the Idaho four. Interesting, right? Yeah. I thought it was very interesting. It kind of blew me away a little bit like, Oh wait, wow. That is so a large knife stabbed 37 times and then got in his car that had plastic over the seats, drove home. And then do we know where they found the, the DNA in his car? I, I don't, I, this is a breaking news update, not a, not a case story. So I, I very lightly went through it knowing that this is laying a little bit of a foundation for the story later. Interesting, right? Hmm. So, um, I just, I think that, he was bleaching his car. So the cop said bleach? that, yeah, the cop said, I remember there's two types of bleach. The there's oxygen bleach and then uh chlorine bleach or whatever. I don't know which one, um, but they clearly found residue of bleach in his car. There was clearly uh, evidence within his car. I don't know if that means that there was like sustainable DNA that they could pull from his car, but enough for them to, to say, Yes, 100% definitely. This is evidence from this crime scene in this vehicle. Yeah, so. oxygen bleach isn't any, it's not the same chemical as bleach, like at all. Yeah, there's oxygen bleach and chlorine bleach. Yeah. 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 I just don't know which one he was using. Hmm. So. Uh, Usually people don't use oxygen bleach to clean something like that. You would use like peroxide. Yeah, I I got you. I'm I'm not him. I don't know. I just know that bleach was used. So, hmm. um if if you're smart, you would be using oxygen bleach. If you're not, you would ble be using chlorine bleach, which is going to show visible you know, deterioration of the color and and fabrics and everything else. So, I'm assuming he's using oxygen bleach. That's what I would do. Uh but if I only had a choice between the two, I definitely would not use chlorine. No, I wouldn't use chlorine, but oxygen bleach, I don't know if there's any evidence that that I, I believe it is actually kind of similar to peroxide. I was just trying to rack my brain to try to remember how it works with, 
you know, fluids yeah, and DNA. And I'm pretty I don't sure know if it oxygen, destroys it. I'm pretty sure it does. Um, and I think that, I think it was actually on the list that you covered, you know, last week or the week before. It said but fresh it or long, stored. It was the long word, whatever oh. the actual chemical composition of that is. Um, but anyways, going back to this. This is uh, essentially what people believe Brian Koberger could have done. Yeah. And this failed. There was evidence in his car with his car seats covered. He like people believe they took his, you know, that he took his shower curtain, put it over his seat. That's why there's no evidence in his car, guys. Like makes total sense. This guy did that. And there's evidence not only in his car, but in his home. So one one thing is, um, you know, I've heard actually several people state it has happened before. People have totally committed a crime, got in their car and not got any of the victims CNA in their car. But I have not had a single person reach out and leave an actual example. Any pe people I've heard say that they did not have a specific example. So. I don't know if they're just saying that because they think it sounds nice or if there are real examples. But in those examples, is there an actual example of someone using a knife like this type of crime? Because this is a real example of another crime or somebody use it was the same manner of killing someone, mm -hmm. them getting in their car, him covering the seats and cleaning it the way that they believe Brian Koberger did. Well, it, it didn't work. It failed at all. Yeah. It failed. And and that's exactly why I'm talking about it. And I I, I assume, uh, you know, that our, our viewers picked it up before your explanation there. Um, but yeah, that's exactly it. So, uh, like you were saying, I guess just leave leave a suggestion if you have one. Yeah, I mean, I just I I've heard so many people you say they have cases where it's happened and i i haven't seen one we're going to be talking about another case that's semi-similar a little bit later tonight but uh yeah i i think this is super interesting and uh i found it wild that it, it's literally identical to what they claim a lot of people that believe brian koberger is guilty claim he did right mm -hmm. his drove in there got all this stuff done oh don't worry about the dna he had uh, his uh, shower curtain over his seat uh, and maybe his dash even we don't know uh, and it covered all it got everything like so there's no DNA there and that's that's just not how DNA works anymore with with how precise our tools are um, and yeah yeah you think they would have at least found like a dog hair a person hair like I mean this was one victim the Idaho four is four victims. Okay. And each victim was stabbed similarly amount of times as this one victim. So then you get in a car and sure, if he drove the long way home, I don't think that matters if whether you take five minutes to drive home or 55 minutes to drive home. Um, I do. You, I don't, you're going to bring the same amount of DNA into your home. It doesn't matter. Um, and they didn't find any evidence in his home or in his car. So it, it just adds further doubt to the investigation. And we say this on every single video that we're not trying to prove Brian Koberger is innocent. That's not my goal here. I have no idea if he's innocent or guilty. Uh, I'm just trying to understand the investigation so that I can feel confident that justice is being given. So. Yeah, basically, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, because that doesn't make sense. And yeah. they're going to have to explain that in court. Mm -hmm. Because I think any juror is going to think, wait, what? You're saying this is the crime scene and there's nothing in the car. This is the timeline. This is the crime scene. And he didn't take that evidence anywhere. Yeah, It is nowhere outside of the crime scene. Yeah. But, uh, you know. Let like the know. odds of that, man. I know. I know. Let us know what you think. And that is it for the Thought Riot podcast mm -hmm. breaking news of the week. Thought Riot podcast style. 
All right, you guys. We are talking Idaho for Brian Koberger uh, in relation to the Idaho massacre. That uh, is the main case that we're covering right now. However, however, the the one thing we got to do is dig into another case first in order to get back and caught up to the Idaho four questions. So we're going to start uh, in a different way that I, than I've done before in the past. So, okay. It was a quiet November night in 2004 when tragedy struck the Porco family home in Del Mar, a suburb of Albany. Peter and Joan Porco, a respected couple in the community, were viciously attacked in their own bed. Peter succumbed to his injuries while Joan miraculously survived, albeit with life-altering wounds. The media was quick to descend upon the scene, but amidst the shock and horror, one name emerged as the prime suspect, Christopher Porco, the couple's youngest son. As investigators combed through the evidence, a chilling portrait of family secrets and betrayal began to emerge. Christopher Porco was a charismatic young man, but beneath the surface lay a web of deception and desperation. Financial troubles plagued him, and rumors swirled of strained relationships with his parents. But could these factors drive someone to commit such a heinous act? As the trial unfolded, a key piece of evidence emerged, the Christopher Porco Jeep. The very Jeep proven later to be bought by a fraudulent loan which Christopher Porco was at risk of losing. However, this evidence, along with some other circumstantial evidence, is what seemed to nail the coffin shut for Christopher Porco. Despite maintaining his innocence, Christopher Porco was convicted of second-degree murder and attempted murder. But even as justice was served, the case left behind a haunting legacy of unanswered questions and shattered lives. As we dig through... This chapter of the Porco Files, one case comes to the surface. Idaho 4 and Brian Koberger each had their supposed crimes, each had their supposed cars, each had no evidence. So how could this be? So what happened? I don't want to go into the what if when it comes to the Porco case, okay? Christopher Porco was convicted. There is a lot of true crime communities out there that question whether he's the one who did it or not. And I don't want to go down that route, right? The people have spoken and the people believed he did it. Um, I, I have looked over all the evidence. I'm, I'm more so focused on the vehicle, though, than anything, all right? Okay. And uh, so, essentially, he... Christopher Porco was going to school to keep it as vague as possible so we can get back to the important questions here. Christopher Porco was going to uh, college, and he was 21 at the time. His college was three hours away from his parents' house. Um, he had, like I said, a, a really strained relationship with his parents where um, he had been kicked out of college. His parents bought him out of every problem he's ever had in his life. Like we've seen so many times before. Super codependent. Super codependent parents. All right. He ended up getting kicked out of school and his parents were freaking out because his grades were bad. He said, Oh no, that's not true. My grades weren't bad. Um, they're wrong. Okay. And, and the very next semester after that, he, forges his father's signature on a huge loan to pay for the next semester of school um, and says to his parents, see, look, I'm getting a free semester at school because they lost my final exam from last term. I did pass all my classes and now they realize they messed up. So they're paying for my school this semester. Dude, a college would never do that. Ever, even if they did lose your final exam, they would never do that. They just adjust the grade in the system. Yep. 
They That's would it. not pay your way through school just because they lost an exam. Right. Yeah. So he he forges his dad's signature there, okay? Then he gets a, a car loan and forges his dad's signature on that. And that is not enough. There, uh, there were burglaries at his parents' house that he's believed to be the suspect. Jeez. Somebody that knew the house knew where things were, uh, cut uh, the screen, got in the house um, and like it was targeted where what they knew that they, they were going after, stole two computers. These two computers were later found, but had switched hands so many times that they didn't, you know, they, it couldn't lead to any actual evidence that could be used. Now, um, Peter had a an eBay account with Christopher. Christopher was doing these uh, fraud, fraud schemes on eBay where he was selling things and not sending them. And then he created this story to all these people that he was his brother. And sorry, I can't send that to you because my brother died. What? Really extravagant, wild plans of financial fraudulence and like the amount of confidence that need someone needs to be able to do something like that is insane like that's that's at a sociopathic psych, psychopathic level and that's what a lot of experts have watched Christopher have read through the evidence and and fully believe that he is a sociopath or a psychopath. Yeah, and and I feel like that's the kind of evidence I look for when you see someone who's accused of committing a crime, you're looking for this this clear background and history of being kind of a terrible person you know even if it's hidden and secret mm -hmm. um and they're nice is. nice on the outside like gacy yep. you know he to everyone around him he was amazing and then privately he was literally one of the worst humans who have ever lived yep um but there's a clear line there. Like you, you see things I, there and, I agree. and anytime you don't see that. And it's almost like this person just lived a pretty great life. Maybe they had a few things in the past, like being an addict, you know, um, you know, which doesn't define people. So like, you know, there are millions of people who have moved on or being socially awkward. Yeah. Yeah, you know, or sure. getting bullied once like that's not enough for me because so many people have those issues and all of those issues like so many people have been bullied. I've never met someone. So many that people have been, been addicts bullied. and been bullied or been a bully. It's one or the other. And yeah. normally a bully has been bullied. They're right. being bullied somewhere else. You yeah, know? it may not be at school, maybe at home. Um, So like those things, like so many people carry that. Yeah. in their past like so many and they're not killers like the majority of the population yep has been bullied and then addict that's a huge one too so many people have been addicts and bullied it that is, it's just not enough it's the differences with addiction it's self detrimental this is not this right. is not a selfless crime this is taking advantage of people in a way where it's a level of confidence that you know you are you know, the aggressor in this situation and you have the confidence to fulfill, you know, this fraudulence and he did it and he did it without remorse, did it without thinking twice. And, um, so what it now comes the, the night of the crime. Okay. And what Christopher says he did, which changed later, but we'll just stick with this story. All right. The first statement he made was he was asleep in one of the study halls at his school. All right. Well, one of the fraudulent loans he got, okay, was for a bright yellow Jeep Wrangler. Okay. So that car can't stand out anymore, all right? And I right. did a little background statistics, too, because what I'm highlighting here is the car evidence versus the Idaho 4 car evidence, all right? Now, what's interesting is, like, how likely is it that somebody else is driving 
a yellow special edition uh, Jeep Wrangler. And I looked that up. And when I'm looking at the national statistics on, on yellow Jeep Wranglers, it's such a little percentage that it, it, it says that it's less than 10% of people own Jeeps. And then within that, 5% of those people uh, own, and it's like, it's five colors. It was um, red, sand, green, yellow, and another one own that many of those vehicles. So a very little amount, all right? When you look in comparison to the Idaho 4 case, where a white sedan is the most common vehicle in the entire U.S., literally the most common vehicle in the entire U S but anyways, back to the story. So he, he says he was asleep all night. Well, the police had get evidence here of his Jeep leaving the, uh, that the night of the crime or before the crime, they don't know if it's like midnight, whatever. So his car's leaving at 10 30 PM, the college it's seen driving away from the college. All right. Now, at 8.30 a.m., it's seen driving back. So what is that? So 10.30, 11, 12. So 10 hours, okay? So 10 hours go by with this vehicle gone. He wasn't sleeping, even though he claims and still claims he's innocent to this day. But um, what happened in between that time? Um so on November 15th, 2004, Peter Porco, a 52-year-old uh, appellate court clerk, was brutally attacked with an axe while he slept in his home in Del Mar, a suburb of Albany, New York. His wife, Joan Porco, was also attacked but survived with severe injuries, including the loss of an eye. The investigation into the attack revealed that Peter and Joan Porco's younger son was the prime suspect. So, a lot of people have stated and used this case as an example to say, well, there was no DNA evidence in Christopher's car. But you know what's interesting? And, and this is the big difference here. And I think this is a very big difference. From Christopher's school to his parents' house is three hours. That Jeep was gone 10 hours. So if you take three hours there and three hours back, that's six hours. There's a remaining four hours to play with. That means that Christopher would have had time to clean himself. Mm, that's a great point. Um, because... I feel like in the Idaho 4 case, that's a reason I've seen a lot of people speculate that maybe Brian Koberger took a shower. Maybe he was there longer than they exactly. think, or it was somebody else entirely, and they took a shower, and that's why there's not this trail going out of the home. Um, and I think that's plausible. I think in I order too. to not get anything in the car, you couldn't have just covered your seats and pet foot pedals and steering wheel with plastic. You would have to shower and change. Yes. And, and, and I mean, maybe cover it in plastic for good measure. So, but I mean, I, I just think you would literally have to clean yourself before. I agree. There, there is no other way. Now, Christopher Porco was working as a veterinary assistant after, and did the cleanups after surgery. So he was at least somewhat knowledgeable of what, cleaned up blood and got rid of it and sanitizing and getting sanitizing, everything yep. gone yep and sanitizing know. but what what's interesting again here is that does any of that matter when it comes to his car if you're clean after you conduct the crime you know what i mean yeah i don't think any of it matters And, and I looked all over because this was in 2004. We have had a lot of advancements in 20 years, right? In 2024 now. Um, and I, I don't, I couldn't find anywhere that they swabbed the, um, the showers or anything like that. However, that's where the veterinary cleanup 
could help, right? With a hard surface like a shower, you could flip that shower curtain up. You could wash, do what you got to do, make sure nothing got out, and then spray whatever spray you had from your veterinary solution to make sure that it was cleaned up and taken care of and and fixed. That allowing you to get back in your Jeep, yellow Jeep. What a dummy to drive that. Um, get back in your Jeep and then drive back. I mean. Even in a shower, you could straight up use bleach. Yes, and you can. and yeah. that's not out of the ordinary to have right. you know to clean a shower with bleach. Yeah. So it it's not really great point. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. But also, I, I feel like this isn't even comparable, just based off the time frame. The, how I agree. The my main issue is the time frame. It, it's it's not even. I mean, it's just too quick. Uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't have him in and out of that house that fast and nothing in the car or the home and the t- time frame be so tight of him driving that loop to get back home. Like he literally had no time to stop. None. He had yep. zero time to clean up. Yep. yep. Zero. Well, uh, and it goes back to just the time at the house, though. It, it, it's it's like you're saying that you know most people let's let's just give it a ton of leeway here 20 minutes okay let's say this crime happened in 20 full minutes which that's not the main story but is 20 minutes enough time to take care of the do the crime okay and then clean yourself in a way where you leave absolutely no evidence anywhere in your car And in your home, because so many people have this idea that like, well, he had weeks to clean his car. Obviously, there's no evidence in there. Look, that is not how uh, evidence work. That is not how bodily fluids work. It doesn't matter if it's four years from now. If there was DNA in there, if there was BLOD in there, if there was anything related, right? And I think a lot of people miss this idea that You have a a sharp-edged weapon taking place or being used in the Idaho 4 case. It's not as simple as just B-L-O-D, okay? There is going to be hair that had been cut off and, like, pieces that come with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, And nothing, nothing was found. No hair, no anything. Well, not without to, getting too crucial. Not, here. not to mention that these crimes occurred with the victims in the Idaho Four case in bed. Yeah, and in a girl's bed, there's going to be hair. You have a dog living in this home. You have multiple females. I know when I sweep my floor or wash my sheets, there's balls of hair. There are hair balls. And skin cells. Like, if you are yeah. conducting a crime that's this violent, and we know that Kaylee fought, you know, supposedly she was sitting up. Facial I don't know wounds. how true that Imagine is. Imagine hair getting, it would, like, get in the way and come out, too. You know what I, I mean? I mean, especially if there's a struggle <coughs> in a bed with like, things being moved around. Agreed. Like there's so many skin cells and sheets and comforters. There's so much hair in in comforters and sheets. The like, amount of cross contamination is insane. And in with there being a struggle, house. like if you, if it's not perfectly lined up where you can stand over and there is no movement, even then I'm not 100 percent sure you would get away without a single thing on you. I agree. I don't. But think the I, struggle makes it that much more unlikely. You know. I'm going to use the example of this case here, where as uh, the defense tried arguing that uh, obviously Christopher Porco didn't have any ev- any bodily fluids or DNA or anything on him um, because uh, the axe or whatever w- like keeps it at a distance. And that's not the case, because every time you would pull up, there would be spray that would come up with it. Yeah, that no, that's not how it would work. Right, I I understand that. Yeah, I, I get that. But I think a lot of people also think about the Idaho Four crime and forget that, like every time one stab happened, there had to be a drawback. That drawback pulls everything that that initial stab before it 
just touched. It pulls back. It doesn't matter if you're going sideways. It doesn't matter if you're going this way. It doesn't matter if you're coming top to bottom. Like it is going to come back. Well, Blaker even said that based off of the right. the splatter, which I'm saying it for like that for a reason. It's not that I don't know that it's spatter. Okay. It's just it's trigger. Funny how many people were like, people love to, to correct. Yeah, That's but okay. uh, listen, YouTube does not like certain language. Yeah. Okay. So I don't care about being like correct on the word. We care about you understanding the, the theories point and ideas. Yeah. The idea of it and it also being able to get out there for people to hear it. Because if you say a certain word or you show a certain thing, your video is gone. Yeah. Nobody's going to see it. Um, so he literally, Blaker literally talked about in his PCA that the splatter would have for sure been on him. Like it's probable, yes. which probable means that it, it Very has likely. to be, it's yep. super, super, super likely. They, they don't say, um, that it's likely or could have, they say it is probable, meaning that shows that it was coming up that way. Yeah. I I agree. I agree. And it had so, to have gotten on him, which in a situation where there's four people and you're doing that every time, there's absolutely zero way that whoever did this did not walk out with a single speck of anything on them. Yeah. And, and even getting like real granular with details here. OK, let, let's just assume that someone in all black clothing and a black mask did this. I find it so so unlikely that the one spot that there is skin showing wouldn't have got that got splatter on them even that one area every time you lift that up like the a string of will come that direction you know what i mean i just have a hard time no matter how you lay it out feeling like there wouldn't have been cross contamination directly onto the suspect's body unless they were wearing some kind of goggles or something of that nature that is the only way i could see it not getting on them yeah goggles hmm because you know if if dylan's statement is correct um i and i'm not saying that because i have any negative feelings towards dylan uh, Eyewitness account statements are already very, very, very untrustworthy. And then you put somebody in one of the most stressful situations they've ever been in their entire life, life it's going to become even that much more unlikely uh, or, you know, the, untrustworthy because of the trauma that comes with the human mind and memory and things like that. Um, but if if her statement is correct, I just have a hard time with the idea that there wouldn't be evidence like on them in that short period of time of that person being in that house or persons and walking out and only being able to see eyebrows and no evidence. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't like, understand I just that. Don't get it. The PCA says in that, like, it almost is like she doesn't almost like doesn't know what's going on, but at the same time she does. Cause she's frozen in shock apparently. Um, but that, that's my thing is like, why doesn't it talk about her seeing this person covered in fluid? Like I, I, if you see somebody and you see their eyebrows and their face like that, you would think you would see that they're covered in that. And it wouldn't take you eight hours to call 911. Yeah, I agree. Because the I whole agree. thing with her not calling 911 is like, oh, they passed out and didn't know what was going on. If you see and hear things and then you see somebody walking and they are covered in something you know something just happened yeah and it, it can only be one way or the other you cannot have it both ways right not possible so when we take a second here and take a step back from looking at either of these crimes you have christopher porco which had 10 full hours. If you remove the travel time, four hours, four full hours to break into his parents' house, grab the family axe, 
do this horrible, heinous crime, make sure he was clean enough to get back in his vehicle, again, four hours, right, to target two people that were in their bed um, and clean himself and then take the three-hour drive home. Um, when we're compare, comparing the Brian Koberger case, we're given, you know, between 10 and 20 minutes, even less for some estimates, um, and t- taking his car, driving 15 minutes away from his house, uh, going in there, doing the crime, and leaving with no cleanup. Uh, I just don't see a great comparison here. I think that the breaking news story that we talked about is a better comparison than this. Yeah, I really do. But the ultimate goal here is to know what the thought riot community thinks, you know? Yeah. I think that um, with Brian Koberger only having literally it's, it's like 10 minutes. It's like 10 minutes rough estimate generally is what is alleged. That's how much time he had. Um, And then he immediately leaves and takes an hour and 10 minute drive home and has no time to stop to, and we know he was supposedly picked up on camera, leaving that area, picked up on camera, arriving home. So he literally arrived home in the amount of time it takes to make that drive that they're saying he took, Mm -hmm. meaning he had zero extra time. None. Right. None. Yeah. It makes no sense at all. That is way different. Yeah. Uh yeah. so your breaking news update. That which case was that again? That was David Schroitman. Um, for those of you that didn't watch that video, uh David Schroitman, and we can get into that too here, but uh he was 27. Um uh, of Somerville and just this year, January 30th of 2024 took a knife uh, and ended an associate stabbed her, you know, 37 times um, and uh, got in his car and drove away. And he had a couple days to clean it. Police ended up getting a search warrant, approaching him as they were approaching him. He was cleaning his car but he had covered the seats of his car with bags, plastic, right? Similar to what we see in the Idaho four theory that he took his shower curtain and covered his seats. But um, there was evidence still found in his car and found in his home. So he went, so David Schroitman went from the crime scene into his plastic covered car into his home and took evidence with him to both places. And, you know, I've also heard it alleged that maybe, you know, Brian Koberger left the crime scene naked. Okay. Or in his underwear. And there's those rumors about, you know, Bethany seeing somebody naked. Uh, I've even heard people say, well, maybe he took the shower curtain, laid it on the ground, disrobed, put everything in the shower curtain, wrapped it up and put it in his car, like in a trash bag in his car. Well, the thing is about that is using your own shower curtain, it's going to have your DNA all over it. So if he took took that with him, that's leaving DNA in the crime scene. And that's not there. The only DNA that is there is a few skin cells on a button snap, not even a fingerprint from what we've seen. Um, So I just, you know... I guess maybe if he left the crime scene naked, I guess. I I but still even don't then, think so because you would have then, to have like liquid proof clothing then. Because it it would still get on you. Evidence would still get on you. It would seep. We're talking about four victims here. Four. It'd still be on your face. Yeah. It da- would still go, go through clothing. David Schroitman had one victim stabbed a comparable amount of times. Um, and there was a nut with a, with a knife and there was enough evidence on him, uh, for them to find it in his car, which had been plastic cleaned and in his home. 
That's just a really tough sell here. And we say it on every single one of these videos, just because questioning the narrative isn't what people would like you to think is cool, you know, and we're just not looking for that. We're looking into the science and not paying attention to what's accepted or what's cool or, or anything of that nature. Um, but with the Idaho four case, I, I have no idea if he's guilty. I have no idea if he's innocent. I have no idea if he is a part of the crime, but in a different way, I have no idea if he's one of four people. I have no idea. But I do know that what we're currently told doesn't add up. You know, what's interesting to me is that you have like, I'm going to talk about a case tonight that is really tough. OK, it's a really tough case. Um, it's one of those ones that just makes you hurt. It makes your soul hurt. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, it was preventable. It didn't have to happen this way. Um, but it did. And there was so many people who could have stopped it. There were so many people who could have stopped it. What's interesting to me is that all these people that come out here and are like, don't speculate. You're hurting the case. Um, that's bad. You know, don't question the cops. Don't question all of this are the same people who will come out here and question the cops and talk crap about the cops when they don't have a suspect. When the cops aren't doing their job because they can't find who did something or because some of their missteps led to somebody getting away and then committing another crime, they they will call that out and, and talk crap on the cops then. But if there's a suspect, they're quick to condemn that person and say, no more speculation. It is that person, no matter what you say. Mm. Yeah. I keep seeing that. And it's all mainstream media that does that. And I don't understand it. Your mainstream media will come out and call out the cops only when there's not a suspect or they can't solve a case or they let this person get away. So they did something else, but not when there's major flaws in an investigation and the person, it, their life is at stake. They're being accused of a crime and there's major holes. There's major issues. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, it's not, it's, it's not, really strange. It's not cool to be, you know, punk rock and go against the grain uh, with, when it comes to true crime, people expect you to just have the back of the police, no matter what. But here's the thing though. Um, that's dangerous to just be good faith at all times. I think, uh, this this country was founded on questioning authority, okay? And our laws and our judicial system was built with the intention of being objective so people can question that authority, you know? Um, so for somebody to come out and be like, oh, shame on you, you know, not supporting your police, waving that finger, whatever, um, that's... It, that's just wild. I, I think a lot of times in those situations, it might be because one of those people needs to feel the comfort of that situation being resolved. And, you know, but then there's the other side of the coin like us where I don't feel comfortable because I feel like there's major holes in this case, which means there could be a, a killer or killers still free or we might be ending another life. I, I Those things scare me, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that he's guilty. That is my hope. Me too. I want Brian Koberger to be guilty. I want the uh, case to come forward and the prosecution lay out such an airtight case and answer every single question that we have and every single concern. And I would love to sit here and be like, oh, yeah. Good job. That's amazing. Great work. I, I don't have any questions. That's, a, that's awesome, you know? Yeah, I don't understand why people take such issue either with saying, I hope Koberger's it. That is the best case scenario because they have him incarcerated. The best case scenario is Brian Koberger being guilty. Yeah. It absolutely is for everybody. That gives justice to everyone. That means the killer's off the street and nobody else is going to get hurt by this person. Um, 
that means we're not dealing with like a framing of somebody mm-hmm. that is innocent. Like that is the best case scenario. If Brian Koberger is in fact guilty, him being innocent is a nightmare for yeah. everybody involved. It's a terrifying idea for sure. Literally everybody, the families, other people who are unknowingly going to be a victim, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, the justice system, it's it's a nightmare for literally everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So it is the best case scenario. And I hope that is what it turns out to be. I really do. I hope so, too. I, I really, really, really do. Um, but I would love to know what you guys think about this. Have you heard uh, about the Christopher Porco, Peter Porco case? Um, my most positive best thoughts are with the mother, Joan Porco. You know, oh. So another interesting thing is is she lived, okay? And and gosh, the story is so sad. So Peter, hours later, um, got up out of, like, he was in auto drive. The one, the father, the one who got axed was in autopilot and, and did the same thing that he did every day before he went to work and, like, made his lunch with these injuries and everything, um, you know, did stuff in the bathroom, whatever, and then ended up passing. Um, the mom was in and out of consciousness. She ended up losing her eye. Uh, I, you know, if only he called the cops. I know, I know, I know. They could have both lived. Um, That's so sad. They, dude, they were axed like an axe, like a full sized axe. Um, So law enforcement gets there and they're asking Joan, right? Trying to get an understanding, like what happened? Can, can you answer questions? She couldn't talk. She was in and out of consciousness, but she was able to nod her head and, and more than one person saw this. And, um, he said, did the cop said, did you know your, uh, assailant? And she shook her head. Yes. And he asked, uh, was it a family member? And he, she shook her head. Yes. And then he said, you know, was it this son? Because they have another son that was in the uh, military, like in the Navy or something. And she shook her head. No. And then he asked if it was Christopher um, and she shook her head. Yes. She ended up going into a coma. She lost an eye, all this stuff. But later when she came out, she couldn't remember anything after she had come out of the coma. And uh, she, to this day, fights for Christopher to be let out, but she doesn't remember anything. No way. Yes. Yes. Wild, right? So wild after surviving an ax attack. She believes he's innocent? I don't know. I know that everything leading up to the crime was very codependent and codependency is dangerous. You guys, um, codependency helps breed sociopaths, you know, not all, not all codependency is a very common, uh, illness, a very common issue we have in the U S there are different severities and levels of it, but it has been known that some, you know, serialists have codependent family. Um, but yeah, wild but anyways i'd love to know what you guys think about it uh did you know about these cases the david schroitman case um with the knife the car the plastic the uh christopher porco case with the jeep uh no dna or evidence in there whatsoever uh and then of course the idaho four case which we cover regularly here um and let me know what you think about them Moving on to another Idaho 4 related topic. Um, Something, I don't even know how to explain this. So, so it's something I hear being talked about Mm -hmm. kind of a lot amongst people who closely follow this case. Um, Very closely. There is nothing in mainstream media about it. When you Google it, you can't find anything, <laughs> nothing, at least from my experience. I can't find nothing. Okay. Um, but it's Steve Gonzalez leaked text messages with TikToker Brat Norton. Okay. Now, character analysis, 
posted these on her YouTube channel and the video goes by really quick, like really fast. I had to slow it all the way down and pause to read through them. And I haven't got through every single one of them. I just highlighted some parts I wanted to talk about because I feel like I really need to read through all of them, think about it. You know, I don't know if these are 100% real, but if they are, then this is what Howard Blum was leaked when he wrote his last article talking about the jailhouse snitch, talking about Dylan and Bethany, you know, texting all night. Like, many things Howard Blum stated in his article that last time where everyone was like, oh my gosh, are in these texts. And we know he said he got them from leaked text messages um, between somebody Steve trusted and himself. Now, when you look at this, in the beginning, it shows somebody flicking down their... They clearly have an iPhone. They're flicking down a little sidebar and hitting screen record. And they pull up Facebook Messenger. And on the Facebook Messenger is a Facebook account called Gonzo Gonzalez. Um, that is his Facebook page from all accounts of what I've seen. Um, you Wait, know, it shows them pull it down and then hit record mm -hmm. because technically it wouldn't be recording yet until you hit record. Oh, you're right. Hold on. Let's let's do a it's replay. Okay. We, we no, don't... that's important. You're absolutely correct in saying that. That's important. Okay, so. Okay. Well, no, you don't really hit, see them hitting record. It's just no. their menu. Okay. Um, so it's just pulled up and then goes away. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I'm That's wrong. That's what I would expect to see because yeah. I was like, wait. Yeah, because when I hit record on my but screen. Let me, see the, let me see his account. So when you go to uh, Gonzo Gonzalez's Facebook page, it's been around for a very long time. You scroll to the bottom. It's been around for many years, um, <clears throat> which I can put a screen recording. It's also um, connected to Christie's account and family members. It's to very clear, clear it's though, a real that, account. That doesn't necessarily mean that's coming from his account. There could be another. There account could be another that saved fake account. His picture and use the same information. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um. Because I've read some of these because I know that a lot of uh, our viewers left comments like, "Hey, have you heard about this? Have you heard about this?" So I'm glad that you're bringing it up for sure. Um. But uh, interesting. I think there actually might be a part where they click on his profile and pull it up. Why did it show Russian right there? Um, so this is from very early on in the case. Um, for It goes on for a while. Like it, It's clearly hit and miss communication um, between, you know, this there. Oh! Oh my gosh, I did not mean to have audio on. Um, it's very clearly communication over an extended amount of time. Again, if it's real, I don't know. Uh, you know, it seems like somebody would have had to have gone through a lot to text all of this stuff and then screen record it to make it look like it's Steve. Um, but I mean, because like there's no way this was a conversation between two random people. And then uh, they just switch the name and profile picture on their account. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's clearly from Steve's perspective. Like somebody would have had to have gone through and texted themselves or a friend over and over and over. One person pretending to be Steve, the other pretending to be Brat, if not Brat herself. Um, it would be a lot. Now, you just have to watch it, and also there's a, a Google Drive link that another YouTuber, which I don't know that YouTuber, um, I don't even know their name, I just randomly came across it, um, that posted screenshots from all of it. It's a lot. Okay. It's a lot of messages. Uh, yeah. They pull up the full account in this video. 
Okay. Okay. That that doesn't necessarily mean still. That, no, I believe you. I, yeah. I believe it can still be faked. Yeah. But regardless, let's I feel see like what this some... would be massive if it was real. And it makes me question, because like I said, I've read some of them. Like, like you're saying, it's a lot, you guys, like a lot. So like I quickly sped, jumped randomly through them just to see if there was anything that stood out, you know? Um, and, uh, and uh, it's just, it's so much information. I just, this is like, this is like drugs for mainstream media. So like, why isn't it being picked up? Yeah, I'm I'm wondering Why? that too. Is there some kind of liti litigation That's going what on? I'm but even if there's litigation, why wouldn't mainstream media still say, "Okay, there's all these messages and, you know, there's a lawsuit." Why not? Because he's a grieving father? I don't know. I yeah. don't know. I don't know, but thank you to character analysis. Uh, we've had some back and forth with her before. I love yeah. her as a creator. She has amazing content. She makes me think a lot, and we see things sometimes from the opposite perspective, um, and it's a healthy conversation every time, and I, I highly appreciate her. I don't know why she posted this. I don't know where she got it from. I don't know if she believes it's real or not. Um, all her description says is back in October, author Howard Blum wrote an article based on messages Steve Gonzalez exchanged with an internet detective, in quotes. In the messages, SG alleged that he spoke with a grand jury member and received inside info regarding evidence presented by the prosecution. Uh, for a clear view of the messages, see this slideshow from Sleuthing the Truth, and she posts a Google Drive link in her video description, which mm. I didn't realize she posted that in there. I got it from somewhere else, but, you know, shout out to them. That's awesome. The only issue with that Google Drive is that a lot of the messages are not as clear as they are from character analysis video. They look like they've been altered by AI or because the quality is so bad in some just random parts of like you look at one screenshot and you see words like and it's legible. And then all of a sudden this one block of text looks like a bunch of jumbled up letters. And the only reason I think it's AI is because I have tried to fix um, like somebody will have like say I'm wearing a shirt with text on it and it says something and the picture, the quality of the picture isn't so great, or a victim, you know, for a, a thumbnail, they'll be wearing a shirt with text on it, and the quality of the picture isn't very good, so there's enhancers you can use that are AI-powered, and um, they fix the quality and make it look better. Mm. Well, sometimes it doesn't fix the quality of the shirt, it jumble, it tries to guess mm. what <laughs> it's supposed to look like and you'll just get a bunch of jumbled up weird looking letters that aren't in any language mm. um that's what it looks like to me is almost like they've been somehow altered with some kind of ai powered thing like maybe they were trying to fix the quality and it messed up a failed enhancement of some kind yeah i think it would have been much better just to give it, it to everybody raw if that is what happened either mm -hmm. that or these are fake yeah. I have not seen an explanation of how these were obtained. None of Brat Norton's uh, social medias talk about it. Um, but so I'm not going to take you through all the messages. It's way too much. I suggest going over to character analysis video, slowing it down to the slowest speed setting and pausing and reading through each one yourself. And you got to be quick with the pause button. Let me tell you, because mm -hmm. even in the slowest speed, it's still going by super fast. Yeah. Um, so, basically, they're just reaching out, okay, and saying, like, hey, Steve, someone on my TikTok told me you wanted to see the screenshots of Pinterest for Costas. And this is June 2nd, I'm assuming 2023. This is still pretty early on in the case, but after Koberger has been caught. Um, and then Steve is replying, yeah, some pages that were deleted. And that's how the conversation starts. 
And then, you know, there's, there's some conversation, but one thing I want to mention is that in these messages, okay, we're assuming it's Brat Norton and Steve. Again, I don't know if it actually is, but Brat says that she's working with Howard Blum. specifically says i'm working with howard blum would you be interested in talking to me and you know she throughout this whole thing she's really nice and acting like she's on his side and like you know i want justice for you and your daughter if you need me to look into anything i will look into absolutely anything for you um offering him up information like clearly trying really hard to gain his trust um build a connection and build a connection exactly but I thought that was I thought that was super interesting that literally in the messages she's trying to get Steve to talk to her um mm -hmm. about more details in the case, offering up information from her research, saying she has sources, saying she has friends that you know can read code and all these things, at, like trying to be a valued source for him so that he can be a valued source for her. Um, I don't know, I found it interesting. Um, it makes me feel honestly really bad for Kaylee's family. Yeah. Like this whole situation. I think this is extremely wrong to try to get a victim's family to trust you to use their information for your own benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I. And again, we don't know if these are real, so I don't know. But anybody yeah. who would do that that's wrong. I would, yeah. that's why I don't reach out to people like that. I, I'm all for free press and everything. Um, I just think honestly, that, not manipulative and shady. Yeah. I just think people should be aware of the person that they're trying to pursue. If, uh, you know, they're going through a personal trauma, um, that I, you need to take that into account and you can't pursue them and, and information and a statement in the same way that you would uh, somebody that, you know, is not that way, like a whistleblower or something of that nature. It, those are two very different things in my opinion. Um, and uh, again, yeah, I don't, I don't know if this is true. I have no idea whatsoever. Some of the messages that I've read are like, jaw droppers um but some of them that i read have also been very very like hot topic topics that the true crime community in general has dug into you know one after another after another so it makes me wonder how real they are like you're saying well let's you know? let's dig into some of the comments so in in one message brat Okay, again, not knowing if it's real, I'm just going to say who's talking based off of what I see, okay? is Brat says, it's um, I want BK to be involved and them not to have the wrong person, you know. Trust me, Steve, we're working so hard behind the scenes for the truth to come out, and we just want justice for you and your family. But what's hard is we all feel strongly it wasn't overstocking and others are involved, including BK. Then, supposedly, Steve says they have him buying the K-Bar and trying to hide how he purchased it. Um, and she says, yeah, I definitely think BK is involved. Uh, it's all on camera from what I've been told. His car, Murphy freaking out, him taking off at 4.21 a.m. That's another really interesting thing is interesting. everyone kept saying it was so silent. It was so quiet. Why wasn't the dog barking? Well, for one, that's not what we heard from the PCA. The PCA literally says the witness, Dylan heard things also that the dog was barking, that there's distorted audio and there's a dog barking on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we know that things were heard. We know that the dog was barking. We know there was noise. It was not quiet. Yeah. That I feel like we can throw that whole it was quiet out the window at this point. The PCA yeah. itself totally says the opposite. So I'm not sure why that ever became a thing that it was quiet. <laughs> it wasn't. It was not. Yeah, I think maybe it could be that people were like associating a certain type of like silent hit 
with mm-hmm. this crime, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like somebody, like a ninja went in there and da, 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 did what they got to do and then out of there and nobody heard anything. It's like nothing ever happened. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it doesn't seem like, even with the evidence that they do have, that that is the case. It's clearly not. Yeah. Um, so Steve asked her if she knows anything about the two protected witnesses. Um, and well, I'm assuming it's two, actually. I think I don't think he says two, but the witnesses, protected witnesses. And there she says basically there's speculation about Kopaka. And um, I thought that was interesting. And Steve says, I have to keep the witness under wraps. The FBI warned me they don't play games. And again, I'm skipping through these, so I'm not telling you them like again, it's so many. So I'm gonna kind of talk about things that are in the same realm, but I'm going to be skipping through these. I'm not giving you a play by play. Uh, Steve said, I have to keep the witness under wraps. The FBI warned me they don't play games with protected informants and they could be monitoring everything I say. We've noticed some quite odd communication behaviors. Uh, Why did you stop working with Blum? And he says that another author wanted to work with them, Peterson. Okay. And that the Peterson guy is the one who helped connect them with a grand jury member. Hmm. Interesting, right? Yeah. So Steve sends her an image and it is of three people walking into the, it looks like the Linda Lane footage and it's three kids, like, you know, college age kids walking into the apartment, like where the, all those cars are parked and stuff. Hmm. And okay. asks if she's seen it. And also the video of that guy grabbing something out of the dumpster that we've talked about before. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. So I'm telling you, it, we've watched that video on stream, I think, a couple times. And there are so many of our viewers that feel like it's nothing. And I, I think it's something. I just don't know if it's something that's associated with the crime. And l- I've said it a million times that I think that it could be a dope situation where, you know, somebody dropped it off and that person came to pick it up. Because the thing is like, I, I grew up in Southern California. All right. We have trash diggers everywhere. Literally almost every trash gets gone through and they don't go, they don't stick their head in there for five seconds, looking for something specific, grab something and then walk away. That is not somebody just looking through the trash for recyclables for, you know what I mean? They were, Mm -hmm. they were, they were there looking for something specific. So, uh, yeah, I I think so too. I agree with you. I definitely think he took something out of that trash, but did it have Um, to do with one, one, two, two? I, I have no idea. None. Yeah. So Steve says, um, that chief Fry, um, said something about both Jacks being cleared. He said he, they don't get that information anymore and that Jack did a lie detector and gave his DNA and there are cameras showing him entering his house and going to bed. Um, he could get to... he. I, I think he's trying to say, which it seems like he misspells a lot of things, um, that he couldn't get to their house without being on camera or at le- least not very easily. Um, and that Brian Koberger is toast over the cast uh, viz cast viz cell traces. The grand jury members said, "What does viz mean? V I S after cast." I mean, I or is he misspelling quite, again? I think probably uh, because uh, there's a lot of different things that viz could mean, but it, I think the obvious one is visibility. The cast visibility report, maybe I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up because it's oh, the never- cast via via cell traces, the cast via cell traces. Okay, okay. Well, I I hope they have good evidence. I do, you guys. I I really hope so. I know it's not going to be on triangulation though. So I hope that that cast report has the metadata the background the application data the geo blended uh gps data like i i really hope that's what it is you know yeah because the triangulation is not there it just isn't um i yeah absolutely i hope there's more with it um so she says something about dylan and like you asked about dylan do you know if she left that night 
And Steve said, they shouldn't have even been called as witnesses. They didn't help at all. Um, and then Brat says, because Dylan plays w what seems to be the only role to the time frame, I guess now besides all this footage. And Steve says, yeah, they created more questions than answers. Um, they talked the whole time it was going down. The crime was going down with texts. They were talking the entire time. Murphy was barking and growling for 10 minutes and then stops and the white car takes off at that same time when like right after. Right after Murphy stopped growling and barking, the white car took off. The DNA in the vehicle. We just got done talking about it. I just don't get it. Mm hmm. So I just hope that someone is able to come out and explain it. Right. And look, if Brian Koberger ends up being proven to be the guy and be guilty, okay, just how? Like, please, I hope that somebody has figured out how it was done. Right. Uh, so also, he says the grand jury members told the author, the Peterson author, they wanted to go in the house and hear things firsthand. This book will be released for the trial, and he uh, is putting that book. And he's putting that in the book and why he said he wanted to speak with us. And they're trying to fight the house being torn down, basically. That makes sense. If they were told by grand jury members, we wanted to see that house and go inside of it and hear things firsthand because these witnesses aren't making any sense. They're supposed to be allowed to. Yeah. Based off what we read. The grand jury should, they literally are supposed to conduct their Unfettered. own investigation. Unfettered investigation. Yes. That's correct. And if they weren't allowed to, that is such an abuse of the system. That's so messed up. And again, and most of the time they're not allowed to actually. And, and let's, let's look at this where Brian Koberger is guilty, right? Why would the prosecution make mistakes in this way? Like, are you literally setting it up for there to be a retrial? You know what I mean? If if Brian Koberger is the guy, then why are these things not buttoned up, tightened up? There's problems. Like there are issues here, regardless of if his if he's guilty or innocent. It drives me nuts. Yeah. So so get this. You know this picture from across the street? Okay. If this is, these texts are real, that's where this picture you're seeing on the screen, that's across the street from 1122 King Road, that shows the porch, and it shows cars all parked in the front, and we have talked about a white truck passing there, it comes from here. Because in this, Brat Norton claims she's the one who released that. That she's, she put out information Steve was giving her, and people were telling her that they were basically giving her crap online about it. And Steve says about this picture that the camera is way closer and shows them getting dropped off. No one was getting killed at 156. That means this had to have catched the DoorDash. It had to have caught the DoorDash too. Mm -hmm. It had to have caught. But isn't he isn't Koberger? Steve responding there saying that that's not a real shot, essentially. That, hey, it's actually way closer. What? What's he stupid? sent that. He said, look at this timestamp. The oh, camera is oh. way closer and shows a girl. He sent that picture. Got it. To got Brat. It. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, something was going down on that audio from Linda Lane. It just wasn't at 1122 King Road. Um, so he's essentially... He says in this that audio from that camera and the Linda Lane, they don't match up. They're not the same. So whatever was going down in that Linda Lane thing where people were fighting and things were happening, it wasn't happening at 1122 King Road. Okay. Because this audio doesn't, you can't hear any of that. Got it. Okay. Um. So he also was trying to figure out who those kids were walking in that footage that I was talking about earlier, the three kids walking into the Linda Lane snap, the, the shot. Um, the if they had been interviewed, like, uh, AI, this, this one that I showed you earlier. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so 
basically he he's like you know i don't i they're we'll assume they're witnesses i don't think they're involved or anything um they look like they're wearing bow ties and getting back from a party um they sent it to the chapins and to see if they know who it was um you know he doesn't want them threatened he just wants to know if they saw anything um fair ask yeah but here after he was talking about you know how the audio doesn't match up and everything um he says it is mostly ann putting out the f- and meaning ann taylor putting out the weakest footage hoping to suggest that this is all the prosecution has it just doesn't make any sense that everything that leaks is crap the prosecution didn't even use in the grand jury case, which they weren't a part of. Meaning the defense wasn't a part of it. Why is he assuming it's Ann? Who's telling him that? Because you have to understand how many people are interested in this case and are digging and unearthing any little thing they can find. So why are you assuming it's the pros- It's the defense? Yeah. Now, I do believe those tactics have been used in this case, and I think that they may very well have been used on both sides, but I don't know why he's assuming it's Anne here. Yeah, I don't know. It, because because when it when when the, the when the when the when the it didn't help when the, the tires hit the road or whatever the asphalt hits the road, when those jurors are in there watching the real footage that matters. This isn't going to matter anymore. Well, it, and not only that, when you look at what the that footage did for the defense, it hurt Brian Koberger. All that footage has done is hurt Brian Koberger. It has. Koberger. It has not there helped. There's not one thing that has helped. The, the horrible picture of the white Elantra, it hurt him. That got people believing that's literally his car, whether it is or not. And it's just not confirmable because it's so bad is what I'm getting at. So it should be like thrown away because there's nothing def- defining in it that can say, yes, definitely. This is this person, you know, with the Linda Lane footage. Again, I don't think there's anything in there that is like, yes, hundred percent. This is this person. You have Gray Hughes going on court TV, proving it's Brian Koberger. Now, Right. The only person out there. That's why it's not helping the defense in any way, because then you have mainstream media that's taking that grainy footage, stamping Brian Koberger on it and running with that. All it's done is hurt. It hasn't helped. The only person out there trying to get the information out that they've ID'd the car, not as Koberger's is literally like, get a clue. That is the only person who has actually tried to identify the vehicles and and try to prove that it. I mean, he wasn't trying to prove it. He was just trying to ID them. I mean, to see what they were. And he does believe one of those cars is an Elantra. Hmm. So I just don't think any of that proves that it was Brian. I'm not sure why. Just because some times match up, that means it has to be Brian. <laughs> like, it seems a bit silly to me. That that like oh because because the PCA says this time and this car is driving at this time oh it's for sure Brian and he's guilty like that makes no sense to me mm. um because you don't see Brian in it you can hardly even see a car yeah yeah and I just don't see how that could help the defense at all no in any way so, I don't either uh yeah I'm I'm curious I I would be curious to know why he believes it's Anne taylor also um that would not be a good tactic for uh, the defense i agree with you what would be a good tactic for the defense is using uh you know very clearly defined other focal points Mm -hmm. other cars other things you know so yeah, I don't think it would help at all. There, it hasn't helped. If they if they did do it to help, they failed at helping the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so what's interesting is that this is about Hunter coming over, okay? But they didn't have a timestamp, um, and basically, Brat says, you know, that they heard it was Ethan's best friend and a person's girlfriend. Um, that there were two or three people that walked Zana and Ethan back to the house that night. 
Uh, he said Ethan's best friend and that person's girlfriend. So we think it's Hunter and his girlfriend. Um, and then Steve just replies. It's odd. She didn't mention anything about a dog because the grand jury says that's how it starts. And for some time, it's all you can hear. I talked to Hunter. He said he found Ethan. We also talked with a neighbor the day this happened. She had a wild story that she heard from the survivors saying what happened. The survivors talked to a neighbor? Hmm. Now that I would be interested in hearing. What is and that nothing was story? mentioned about the dog? So, so does that mean in Dylan's statement, she never claimed to have heard the dog barking? She only said she heard like playing, but what, no barking or growling? Because didn't all of it start with her claiming that she heard Kaylee playing with the dog and then after that Kaylee said, I think someone's here? I believe so, yeah, without pulling it up in front of me. Yeah, I think. I don't know. If I'm wrong, let me know. I can't I, I still can't memorize all of that. <laughs> like I still can't. No, no I'm not even gonna try. I I'll, I won't be able to. Um But, um, so here's another interesting one. The girls toxicology reports came back clean and clear. Okay. Stacy said that Ethan was clear as well. Okay. Odd thing is, is there are mixed stories with two other events. Oh, wait, hold on. I skipped one. Um, he talks about basically the drug theory and says that he knows Xana had family that was involved in some stuff, but all she, the most she did was basically Molly and that nothing that would lead to something like this, that the girls, you know, only had to drive down the street really to go get pot. I mean, Molly um, leads to stuff like this. Well, Molly is a big deal. That's just as serious as like, cocaine is crack yeah i mean it's not like pot no it's not like pot it, it isn't it's illegal um and it will get you involved in you know shady characters it's, it can it's managed by the mob so um Basically says Xana's family has some history, but I was told she did party drugs like Molly, but nothing that was hardcore that could lead to behaviors like this. Buying weed seems fake, to be honest. The kids would just go down the street like eight miles and get it from a store. Christy went with them once to just okay. check it out. Kaylee would be super paranoid and hated it. I've never done drugs ever. Christy barely did before we got together. Nothing much after. The drug stuff seems Hollywood, knowing the toxicology reports were all clear. Um, the, the weed they, they have just over the border seems to be what everyone was getting. Like we've been at senior nights like five times and the cartoon like rappers are a clear giveaway. Plus explain how a hit would have missed Ethan and Kaylee's new car. No pro is going to rough up someone, not know who all is in the house. They're about to shake down. Honestly, the drug killing seems way far out there. You think if there was a hit and there was a new car there, the people wouldn't go in? No. No, there's nothing that would have stopped it. Agreed. I, again, I. If there's a legit not, hit on you, they're going in there no matter what. I do not think. Unless they're straight up cops. It's a mafia related hit like no. that. Like no, what he's either. suggesting. I do not think in, in any way that it could be that. However, with the question you're asking, if by chance it was. It doesn't matter. There could be five Lamborghinis out front. They are going in to do the job. Mm -hmm. Period. Agree. Every time. So. Yeah. If it's a real hit like that, it, you can run, you can hide, but they're going to catch you. They're going to get you. It doesn't it, matter who's around. It's how many people are going to wait in the car and how many people are going to come inside is what's going to determine how many cars are out there. You know what I mean? So yeah. is, is one person going in or are four people going in? So it, you know, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so he says about Dylan and Bethany's stories that the odd thing is, is their stories are mixed with two different events. Two different events. And I don't, there's no more him clearing that up because the next thing he mentions is Kopaka was 36. My girls would want nothing to do with any old school loser who wanted to hang out with girls 16 years younger. Yeah. Which is weird. Like he just randomly said that. Yeah. I mean, for one, that's not always true, but the majority of the time, yes, I agree. Uh, for two, um, for someone to be older and have the urge to end another person's life, the, the victim doesn't necessarily have to have any emotional involvement. So agreed. Um, it can be everything obsessive, uh, in your head fantasy. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it could be he goes to the same gym as them. Like, yeah. or, you know, like just something super random. Um, he says that BK purchased a K bar and Dickie's overall outfit and can't explain where they are after the cops checked all his belongings and could fi couldn't find either one. He sends a picture of what the suit looks like, apparently. Yeah, I mean, look, it, if that ends up being the case, that is good evidence. That really is. Um, it, sh proving that somebody purchased something that is potentially crime related, uh, not that long before a crime and then not being able to come up with it. That's good evidence. It is good evidence. Yeah. Um, then Steve says, remember the report BF saw a naked guy. We heard he took this off at the sl glass slider, placed it in a plastic garbage bag, and she noticed his leaving in his underwear. They have the receipt for it, and he purchased it at Pullman Walmart also on camera. I hope so. I really do. I hope so. He is toast, but someone might have played a part helping, but seems to be risky for him to do that. People always talk. So here, this is a, this is um <clears throat> really interesting when it comes to the roommates. Steve says, I'm not, I am not what is all being said. Now, again, he, the way he texts, okay, it's hardly legible in some areas, <laughs> but I have heard repeatedly DM is shady and should be looked into. And with the, with the him not texting very well, I've, heard from multiple people saying that is normally how he types. Um, he spells Maddie's name wrong. And that's something that's consistent across everywhere, not just these leaked messages, which is why that adds more value to these actually being real is that it's consistent with the way he talks and types. The grand jury members both said they didn't believe her testimony, meaning Dylan's, um, that she's shady Okay, should be looked into. And it created more questions than answers. They said some of them said she would be investigated, but for a reason we don't fully understand, they didn't feel that Bethany was shady um, or was as shady. We only had so much time to ask questions. Hmm. Okay. Weird, right? Yeah. One thing most people don't know is if Dylan and especially BF are well connected. Most thing people. Okay. I got that wrong. One thing people don't know is that DM and especially Bethany. Okay. Dylan, and especially Bethany are well connected and have friends in powerful positions. Um, <clears throat> the, yeah. I read that one. It says, don't know if. One thing most people don't know if DM and especially BF are well connected and have friends in powerful positions. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was reading that, I read that as like question. Oh, okay. Not statement. Um, that's been talked about before and I don't really want to get into that. So. 
So he says that he doesn't watch very many channels. FBI reps said to be careful um, that you'll get super confused years down the road and not know what your facts are, where you got them from. And all it takes is getting something wrong once and the media will destroy your reputation and you won't be talking to any of it, any of them after that. Yeah. Um, he says he knows IT and we don't allow TikTok on any company devices. 100% the truth. I bet I've never seen your show unless I watched it on a browser. Um, FBI got so involved because BK was being monitored back in Pennsylvania before the crime. He went down because of the informant. He didn't plan on getting caught. Mm, okay. That's so he essentially says... That the only way, and there's more messages kind of about this, that the only way he got caught was because of the FBI. That the Moscow PD would have never caught him. The FBI is the sole reason that he got caught and he was already being monitored in Pennsylvania. Mm. Which almost makes me wonder, is there actually some kind of legitimacy to the Russian hacker theory? Was, if Brian Koberger is guilty, was he doing things on the dark web? And a hacker knew him and the FBI was tracking him. Mm. Wouldn't that be crazy? It would be. It would be. But if you're doing the dark web right and he is trained in that stuff, uh, it, it, you can't just be tracked. True. It doesn't work like that. The, you cannot be tracked. The FBI do regularly try to monitor the dark web, though. They they do monitor the dark web, but when they catch people up and, and close things down like Rainbow Road, um, which is a place for anybody that doesn't know what it is, it was an online marketplace for all things illegal, for drugs, guns, hits, um, IDs. Anything illegal. Literally anything illegal. And the way that they shut that down is they started making buys and then they would watch the drop zone catch that person then they started connecting bank accounts like it was footwork it was not it work hmm. it was footwork that were you know using tools on the back end track where this money went uh go to the drop zone and pick up the person that dropped it off in that drop zone uh you know what i mean so one thing about the pool party, because this has been brought up a lot too, is that Steve says Kaylee and Jack were at an indoor pool party. Um, and I'm guessing it was like the same day or around the same day as Brian Koberger at that pool party we've all heard about. And that Christy has pictures of it and it was at a hotel. And um, Brat says, hmm, not the pool party then because Brian Koberger was at the Grove, an outdoor apartment complex party. And she asked him to attach a picture. He never does from what I saw. Um, he said he has a single photo. All the kids were together inside. Kaylee and Maddie might have been Jack as well. Um, I can get it. I was just mad because Christy, uh, at, mad at Christy because I asked about the pool party. She said she didn't know. Then she shows me a picture. <laughs> um, he also liked their stuff via Instagram and LinkedIn. They took Kaylee's down. Which is, remember, with Chronicles of Olivia, Chronicles of Olivia talked to Olivia, Kaylee's sister, and the the account was literally taken down the next day. And Olivia called the police department and was like, why did you take down her LinkedIn? And they're like, what? We didn't. Mm. So what does that mean? And why didn't Steve say that? Why do you say they took down Kaylee's LinkedIn? Maybe LinkedIn did it. I don't know. Hmm. Sounds like he contacted Maddie on Instagram, but she never opened the messages. And there were so many fake accounts, but the only way they would know that is if, like, if they actually saw the messages and they had a previous date. So, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. And for anyone watching this still goes back to look it, if you're watching us if brian gets proved without a doubt to be guilty and the fbi was watching him in pennsylvania because let's say he's been doing 
horribly shady stuff for a long time and was that good at hiding his tracks. Maybe he was doing red room type stuff or something like that on, on the dark web. Um, it doesn't change anything that we've looked into, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, people often comment on our videos saying that, um, like, leaving comments, well, you know, what if he's guilty? Like, what are you going to say then? I'm not... Nothing changes. No. Nothing changes. That's the whole point in looking into the investigation is whether he ends up being guilty or innocent. This investigation and the details that we've been given thus far, it is what it is. You know, it mm -hmm. is what it is. Yeah. We're, uh, we want Brian Koberger to be guilty. I don't know how many times we have to say that. I don't I don't know why we get put in a box of like innocenters. We're, we're not either. We're not pro him being guilty or pro him being innocent we just want justice for everybody and like i said earlier the best case scenario is him being guilty for everyone now if he's innocent that's a major issue and i i think that it's it's crazy to me how people act like speculating about his innocence or how it could be somebody else is damaging to the case. Yet you think speculating about his guilt and trying to prove he's guilty is okay. Yeah. It's the same. It's the same problem. Same problem. It is the same problem. It's the same coin, different sides. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there is one interesting part I want to mention. This is going on for a really long time. Um, so I want to kind of wrap it up. He does talk a lot about uh, audio and stuff being edited and fake and blaming it on the defense team. Um, and he also talks about that he... They're public defenders. I, I could see a defense team doing that that is like a high-value defense team, high-paid attorneys. But like these are public defenders I, know. I have a very hard time thinking that they would go out of their way to do something like that that's like trolls online like do they exist sure is there people who take the time to fake stuff sure but it's very few and far between the majority of the population and people out there they don't have time to put no. effort into that stuff. They don't even have time to do their own research into cases like these, which is why they come onto shows like ours to get a rundown from people who do have some time that can do it, you know? Exactly. Absolutely. Um, but two things I want to mention real quick is he says, we do have a long story about another story that came from a jailhouse so-called snitch, but it never developed into anything we could find proof of. We spent weeks trying and interviewing some shady leads, um, which I guess that's where the jailhouse snitch comes from, uh, which is interesting. And he also mentions, which I'm trying to find here, um, Oh, oh, okay. There's one more thing actually too. Uh, she is for sure protected by her stepmother's law firm. And she's talking about Dylan or he is talking about Dylan. Sounds like there's some power in that firm. They're also being helped by Jack Showalter's family. They tr threatened to sue me pretty early into the case, sent somebody to my house. They trespassed, came down my driveway, right up on my porch. It was pretty wild. They have a full phone dump of both girls' phones. Gosh, I, I just and we don't have to go into that that stuff because we don't know if this is true. All of it, it is hard. So, I mean, that's that's real. That's accusatory. So that's why I have an issue with it. I yeah, have an issue sure. with any parts that are accusatory, like saying, "Oh, you know, Dylan Mortensen and Bethany Funk." are protected by big, giant, powerful families. Like, that's accusatory, and that is making an, a guilty assumption of them in this case. And I feel r weird talking about that because, one, I don't even know if this is real. Yeah, I agree so with you. So I, I don't want to go down that road until it's verified, 100% verified, because it's accusatory. Well, and just it's because gonna, you... It's feed the frenzy of people out there that are doing really mean things and saying really horrible things, stuff like that justifies their behaviors and being jerks. And we got to be careful about that. We do need to be careful. But I also want to mention having a lawyer does not mean you're being protected by powerful people. Steve's family lawyered up right away. 
If you're smart, you get a lawyer. That does not mean you have powerful people behind you. A lawyer is a lawyer. And that law, law firm that he's talking about isn't even in Idaho. Mm -hmm. So how does that give her a step up above anyone else? I just don't see that. I don't. You're right. We do have to be careful with that. But it's also not fair to say somebody's being protected by powerful people just because they have a lawyer. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I just don't want to comment on it. Anyway, um, he does say that Kaylee had only lived there for six months and her room still had boxes in it. And the one I keep trying to find, which I probably am just going to have to not find it, but mention it, is that he says he has white hat hackers working for him and they have access to all of brian koberger's bank records or yeah. maybe not all of them but a couple of them yeah i, uh, I can't part. remember what However, it all said i i just want to be very clear that is not a white hat hacker that is a black hack hacker so that is illegal um and again i it makes me nervous putting stuff like that out there because one it, steve gonsalves is going to take any heat on this that's the last thing i want him to but that's black hat hacking that is not white hat hacking you are not just allowed to go break into somebody no, somebody's not. personal financials oh yeah they have the cell tower dumps and access to some of his old bank accounts um mm -mm. yeah but that's basically it um i have no idea what to think about any of it honestly because again this could all be fake um I use the names that were used in the messages. I do not know if they are Steve. I do not know if they are Brett Norton. Uh, all I can say is that I feel pretty bad for Steve right now, regardless if they're real or not, <laughs> because people are going to believe they're real. Um, and even if they were real, it's not really fair to him to leak his messages like that. Like, I just, I don't know. I can't imagine being in his situation. I feel really bad for him. Is the information interesting? Is it like a, like, is it not a treasure trove? <laughs> yeah, it's a treasure trove if it's real for people who want to understand this case a little bit better. Um, but in the same respect, I don't want to get information that way. Yeah. Now it's out there. There's nothing we can do about it now. And mm -hmm. we have made the, we've made the, what is it called? The like promise to talk about anything and everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm talking about it. Cause it's already out there and there's nothing we can do about that now. It's on the internet forever. Um, but yeah, I just don't know how it doesn't feel very ethical. Does it? So uh, I want to know what you guys think about the information contained in these messages. Um, do you think they're real? Do you think they're not? Um, they're here to stay now. Um, and if you have any thoughts on them at all. But that's essentially it. All right. All right. So for my second story tonight into one of our cases, mm -hmm. I have to dive back in to the Delphi madness. We have been talking about it almost every week lately because I just feel like it gets crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier. And the reason why I want to dive back into it is one, I, I want to leave this an open conversation. So we'll go pretty much the normal length of uh, one of our case videos in an open conversation style because I want to be able to highlight the areas where this is uncommon for an average case. So one thing that it's really easy to do in any scenario that you're investigating is, is start looking at the case through, you know, a pinhole and uh, to pigeonhole your, your view where you're not paying attention to the outside surroundings of it. So one thing that I think our viewers who watch us probably don't have a lot of time to do is investigate. So they hear us talking about it. And I'm worried that there are a lot of people out there that don't understand like the massive difference in what is normal and what we're seeing in Delphi. Like is Delphi normal drama for a case 
No, it's not. Okay. Does everybody who watches us know that? Um, is what Judge Goal is doing normal decisions for an average judge? No, it's not. But does everybody who watches us know that? Is, you know, the way Richard Allen's being treated uh, standard in any case? No, it's not. But does anyone understand that? You know what I mean? So I wanted to be able to dive in. It seems so obvious, right? It's because, so not normal. Right. And, but it, that's obvious to us because we're investigating this. And then we bring one or two topics to the case table and we talk about the absurdity of that within the Delphi case and not always touching on the broader scope of the entire scenario, the investigation, what we're seeing from Judge Goal. And uh, you have a ton of knowledge on the Delphi case, probably a, more than I do, uh, for sure more than I do. But uh, that's why I figured it is a good idea to to just kind of go into it open-ended here. For anybody that, uh, you know, watches our Idaho 4 stuff and is starting to get into the Delphi stuff because our Delphi videos are starting to get more momentum than they had previously. It made me want to dive back in and just kind of, you know, give the rundown. So, uh, you know, the Delphi murders refer to the tragic case involving the deaths of uh, the teenage girls, Abigail Williams and Liberty German in Delphi, Indiana, um, and uh, the disappearance happened on February 13th, 2017. Abigail was 13. Liberty was 14. They went hiking near Manon High Bridge, which is a super popular trail in Delphi. Multiple people every day. Uh, when they didn't return as expected, their families reported them missing. And uh, they were discovered the following day. And that's what really where the madness begins right there. And that's oh, where we have, immediately. Yeah, I know. Immediately. That's where we have just some key points, right? Um, is the, the layout of the crime scene was strange, uncommon. It is not what you would normally see for uh, a standard murder scene. Um, it uh, it had elements to it which were so outside of what would be normal, um, and a lot of it wasn't even being picked up on at first, right? Then you have the FBI getting involved. Then you have what we found out recently where they uh, unsealed the crime scene, left for a day, and then came back, resealed it, and that's where they found the casing. And that's... Well, the bullet that was not the shot bullet. yeah i'm sorry and the it was buried yeah it was mm -hmm. not just laying there it was under the dirt yeah for yeah. who knows how long now i want to say manon high bridge is only a place a local would know about <clears throat> it is not somewhere that you would like stop by delphi indiana and be like oh yeah let's go to that popular manon high bridge that everybody walks on technically you're not allowed to walk on that bridge it is part of like a trail in the area and pretty much only locals know about it. But yes, a lot of locals, cause it's beautiful out there, like to go walk on it, but it's extremely dangerous. Um, you know, a lot of people thought that the girls fell off the bridge and that's what happened to them because it's dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, we have text messages actually that were leaked and there's questions about if those are real or not, but it was a, a civilian who found the crime scene mm. and they believe it was an uncle of one of the girls. And there's text messages, messages from him saying one of them was nearly like cut. Yeah. Their head was off almost. Wow. Um, and that it was horrible. Uh, you know, we know a little bit more about the crime scene now because of also the Frank's memorandum and that the girls were ensanguinated, you know, drained of blood, um, that there wasn't blood all around them on the ground. It's like they had been drugged there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, Abby was clothed. Libby was not, um, they had knife wounds to the neck, things right, like right, that. Right. Without getting too much into like the, the crime scene itself, but the I want to say scene into... was adultered. It was corrupted immediately by yeah. civilians. Billions. Yep. 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 No, I, I got you. But what's important is like the law enforcement part here. How did the law enforcement manage it and how we're seeing the current judicial system locally manage it there too. And I yeah. think 
it's important that we're just now hearing that the crime scene was uh, evacuated, right? And then came back and then they found this casing. What my first thoughts when I heard that are, okay, well, how did they find it if it was buried, number right. one? Number two, if they brought out metal detectors, like why wasn't that done initially too, right? Because if we're looking at stab wounds, wouldn't it be easy for somebody to take a knife and just push it into the ground? Yes, obviously. So, There's no pictures of it either. Yeah, yeah. They didn't take pictures. Right. So um, there, it just popped up, right? After they unsealed the crime scene and walked away from it for 24 hours and then resealed it. In my opinion, and multiple attorneys have said this, anything that's found after it's been unsealed should be null and void. You have no idea how it got there. You have no idea if it was there during the crime, before the crime, after, during that 24-hour period. You have no idea. But- uh, the local, again, judicial system and law enforcement um, didn't bring that forward willingly, openly, it feels like. Um, and then you have the obvious now, the judge goal and all the decisions she's making. And, and what's interesting is, like I was saying in the beginning of this, the decisions that are being made are so uncommon and the biggest most obvious one is uh the the court record right the uh the court documents that are required by law to be made available publicly unless they've been you know sealed uh for some reason and what's interesting is everywhere you hear judge goal wants to be a supreme court justice like that's her goal to move up you know how are you making decisions like this and you think you're going to move up? Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> she's making understand. awful decisions. The Supreme Court specifically said, stop taking things off the docket. So it's in the fact there's not even a docket. No, there really that isn't. Public has access to like, OK, look at the Brian Koberger docket where you can get all the information and then look at the Indiana one. And there, it nothing. And when they seal something, it has to go through an approval process. Like, and you have a document saying motion to seal. We're not getting that in this case. She is just taking a document that, you know, the state or the defense has put up and just removing it. This docket yeah. is extremely important. Keeping a record is extremely important, not only for the public, but in case he is convicted and yeah. needs to appeal his case then the appellate court has no history they have nothing to go off of yeah and look and listen to this so this is on uh, a law a legal website as you may be aware most court documents are actually available to to the public for viewing under the first amendment most court proceedings are public matters and case files are public record the idea that anyone can look up your name and see the full details of legal dispute you are or were involved in is disconcerting to most americans understanding why court documents are public record why so many people are concerned about privacy and how you can get your court documents sealed can help you understand the U.S. judicial system more thoroughly and navigate your case with confidence. Then it goes into here saying, you know, court records are public information, at least hypothetically, to help citizens hold the government and other organizations accountable for their actions. Making court documents public record can also help citizens keep courts accountable and try to ensure courts are corruption free hello that yeah, can't is... happen when you have a judge removing anything that she deems you know unacceptable on the record yeah. for the public to see and it under the she first just amendment it. yeah that's it is not allowed mm -hmm. and she wants to become a supreme court justice and they're the ones saying what are you doing why like, put it all back Dude, why? Like, she would be the worst Supreme Court judge ever. Wouldn't it be She'd scary be terrifying. if because of this she got it or something crazy like that? She would be a terrifying Supreme Court I, judge. I agree. I agree. Because they have a lot of power. A ton of power. Yeah, I know. I know. But you know one thing I wanted to mention? That right away with the, with the crime scene, um, 
they didn't know what they were doing. You know what I mean? Like, so one thing that I've questioned with that bullet is that, like you said, they sealed it, unsealed it, resealed it, found the bullet, didn't take any pictures. There's no proof of them ever finding it other than that's what they say happened. Well, you have a search warrant for Ron Logan's house. His house literally overlooks the crime scene. It is his property. Mm -hmm. He was a suspect, clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they didn't want to say it officially. Well, they get a search warrant for his place. They mentioned the cell phone pings that he was in the area. He has an, he lied about his alibi and had concocted it literally before anyone ever, like literally before the crime, he had concocted this alibi. Right. Um, and he has a gun that's the same caliber as the bullet that was found yeah. that they found in his home. Yet in the search warrant in any documentation relating to them searching his house, there's no mention of the magic bullet. Why? Where did this magic bullet come from? When was it actually found? Wasn't wasn't it the FBI who conducted the search warrants of yes, this house? Yes, it was. And you know what's so also... So did the FBI not have access to Did they not bullet? know about it? Yeah. Did they have no idea about it? Also, mm. I didn't know this. I, I didn't realize this. I don't know if it slipped past me or something. But they exhumed a cat from Richard Allen's yard and say oh, they matched the cat. Yeah, the, I forgotten about it. Like it slipped past me because I, I didn't really put much thought into this for some reason. Mm -hmm. They exhumed a cat from his yard and said the hair from that cat matches hair they found at the crime scene. No way. Mm hmm. What? That's what they say. I've never heard this. That there's hair matching. I've heard about the cat. I just don't. I don't remember like the the key details of the story. <clears throat> yeah, I don't remember it all either. I just heard it today, earlier today. Since when? I don't remember hearing any of that. Yeah. But, when? And who exhumed it and how? Mm, I don't know. They see like. A, a pile of dirt that didn't have grass there or something. And they're like, let's go digging. Well, on, I would ask then because hair already, you can't get a full STR DNA profile from a hair. Okay. Unless it has a root. Well, I don't know how you do the whole DNA matchup on a cat or if they literally just looked at it and saw similar pattern, but they were out in the wild in the forest. Like, there could be cats out there. Like, did they check to see if they had cats and it was a, a cat that had a similar pattern? Because a lot of towns, if there's a lot of cats in that area, will have very similar looking cats. Yeah. So I would be curious. We need to do some digging into that science. Like, how likely is our science right now to be able to match up a cat hair to a cat hair? Right. Is cat hair different than human hair to where... There's a core that gives them DNA. You know what I mean? I, I found that very intriguing. It slipped past me until today. I didn't, I never thought about it. So, I mean. It's strange. Yeah. It's really strange. Um, but yeah, it, when, when you're over, when you're looking over this entire case from the grand scope here and, and just seeing problem after problem after problem after problem, it still goes back to what we're dealing with currently with Judge Goal. And I've said this already a couple of times, but you have Coffin Daffer, who is like so blue blood, the most blue blood person right. ever, you know, ex FBI. I get it. Okay. I'm not. I'm not putting her as a person down because of it. I understand it because of her background and everything. I get it. But uh, she's coming out and saying like, dude, what the heck is this judge doing? What is wrong with her? You know, exactly. And if she's saying it, you have problems here, Judge Gold, major problems. So like it, as far as I'm concerned, I see a court record that is unaccessible to the general public. Um, so it is not within first amendment rights. Uh, it is not being managed the correct way. It is, it does not have the, 
the the correct sealing uh, requirements of an expiration date and all of those things that come with sealing documents. So I go back to why and how, you know, and then we're seeing like this weird bond that's being created by the prosecution and judge goal where they come from different areas. So the likelihood that they know each other on a personal level is very slim, but why is the judge allowing the prosecution to be so close to the judge's rulings in this case? I don't, I don't understand that either. That's why it feels corrupt to me. Um, is that I feel like there's connections going on here that are improper. <coughs> I, I really do. That's why I did that episode last week talking about um, masonry. And I know it seems far-fetched and it seems tin hat and it's out there. And maybe it is. It is kind of out there. But the thing that's not out there is when you have personal connections okay we know judge goal liked a post about the abby and libby memorial field that people she knows you know kids in her family um played at and she liked the post um like you know she's connected to the case somewhat for one also um her appointing those attorneys that she also had a personal connection with um, yeah, when we're talking about the these... way she, the way she removed the original attorneys was strange. I mean, yeah. it's just one after another and, and the entire time she's had the prosecution very close in these decisions, asking them what their opinion is, where right. that is nowhere in any universe, an acceptable request or ask or offer to give to ask the prosecuting attorneys if they agree with and or believe in or support the judge's decision on the defense attorneys. Like they're, they're equals. That's like, that's like as a parent going to one of your kids and asking what they think about the punishment for another kid. You know what I mean? Right. That's not acceptable. What do you mean? I just don't know about this case. I just feel like the, con- I feel like, okay, so I I came across more information and I'm going to go further into it. There's going to be a part two of the Mason video because this connection between people in fraternities, because that's what we're talking about when we're talking about masonry. Like you can just throw out all of the, you know, yeah, you can throw out all the conspiracy theory stuff about the Freemasons. That's not what's important here. What's important is the connections that fraternities build between people. And important people but they don't just build connections between only important people it's also you can be a nobody and join the masons you do not have to be special which is what makes it interesting that brad holder comes from a family of masons and is a mason because he seems like so random like what he's a mason that's that doesn't make any sense A, a, a gang either member or associate okay like from his own mouth he is a gang member or associate um and in the masons yeah because patrick westfall strange. straight up in sleuth intuitions youtube interview said he was a vinlander yep i know straight up and Brad Holder was his friend and Brad Holder was practicing the Odinism stuff with him. And yeah. he's also a Mason. Like, and then you have the fact that they go to the same lodge as Nick McClelland. Yeah. And you have the fact that goal is also associated with Masons and 33rd degree Masons like Shriners. Cause you have to be a 33rd degree Mason to be a Shriner. Yeah. Yeah. So these connections the tin hat conspiracy stuff doesn't matter. It's the connections. And if you're willing to do favors for people you're connected with, and it just so happens that within this fraternal order, if somebody asks you for help, you have to give it to them and you are required to keep secret. And there are penalties for not doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. And I think that's why, These orders are so dangerous, you know, you know, I would be curious to look into because we've talked briefly on 
and they're never popular videos about, uh, you know, the difference in overall happiness of a nation and how you have like Finland, which is the most happy nation and their government doesn't keep secrets. And it just like, we've drawn the connection that secrets can create distrust and a happiness. Obviously I feel like that's so blatantly obvious. Right. Yep. Um, but then, uh, you have, uh, in Finland, do they have fraternal orders in the same way that we do here? Um, you know? I do know that there are like Nordic Masons. There are Freemasons up in those countries. I just don't know if they're in Finland. Or if it's the same level as it is here. Right. You know, uh, yeah. Because most of That's a good our point. politicians and judicial leaders are a part of some sort of fraternal order. Almost all of them. You're I'm, absolutely right. I go so far as to say more of them are than aren't. Okay. Yep. So, um, and it, a lot of judges and lawyers too. I was too. just going to say that. A yep. lot. If you, if you look at the, the Supreme, uh, judges or justices, or not whatever, just Supreme most, I think, I think, all of them, actually, if I'm remembering correctly, I'm trying to remember what I read, but I think all of them except one or something was in a fraternal order, committed fraternal order, which is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because because then that that begs the question of what's more important then? Uh, is our justice system and our law more important? Is the safety and the rights of the people more important is uh your fraternal orders rules more important if you had a fraternity member lifelong fraternity member come forward and you're a supreme justice and they say look i me and my girl were drinking we had too much to drink uh we got in a fight i snapped and i ended her life uh i need you to help me and and you know, don't go to the police. Like, where is that person's allegiance is going to lie? Because they're in the fraternal order, are they not going to say anything because that's what the fraternal order says to do and they're going to help them? Or are they duty bound by their position? Right. And I think these are very logical questions, not tin hat questions. These are very logical questions. Well, you know, there's some more connections with the Masons in that town that I don't feel comfortable talking about just because it involves victim families but that information's out there that it's a lot more intertwined than it's a small town it is it, a small it's town. a tiny town and all of these mason lodges has all have also converged into like one or two so that all these surrounding towns are all going to the same lodges yeah, and it's lodge number 33 like they're they're <laughs> Most sacred number. Well, there's the Mount Zion Lodge and the Tipton Lodge. Yeah, the Tipton Lodge is, is the, the lodge number 33, which is their most sacred number. But, you know, I it just keeps bringing me back to Judge Goal, you know, and I keep hoping that every time we see a ruling that Judge Goal is going to have somebody close to her call her on her crap and be like, You've told me what you want in your career. Do you realize you are burying your career doing this? You're burying it. You need to stop. You just got that leadership position now for the second time. Why are you not backing out of this and getting your name out of the limelight so that you can move up like you want? Well, doesn't it make you curious why the first judge stepped down? And the prosecutor. We have a prosecutor who stepped down from this case in their job. We've had a judge step down from specifically this case. Uh, it's really weird. It. It is strange. It like, is did strange. they like it almost makes you like my conspiracy brain starts going. It's like, did they need a specific prosecutor and a specific judge on this case? Right. Like. Yeah, and I, you have the old you. town mayor as the prosecutor helping McLeland too. Yeah, yeah, that super young mayor where I was already like a mayor. What? That's just really uncommon. Yeah, no experience, no nothing. But yeah, I I don't understand it, and I I feel like this is why a lot of people are on the outside asking why. And 
when I'm looking at this case, I have a hard time pointing out the areas that are normal. Yeah, having a man incarcerated in a prison before he's ever convicted. I don't know why anybody would ever argue that's okay and saying, well, it's for his safety. You know, the jail said they couldn't keep him safe. Yeah, right. Then you don't understand prison. Yeah. Jail is way safer than prison. Like a million times more safe than prison. Are you kidding? Yeah. And what's interesting, though, and why that always stands out to me is because of who manages the jails. It is uh, the sheriff. Yeah. It is the state sheriff's uh, office that manages the jails. Um, It's part of their job. So are they not a part of this weirdness? I I don't know. Well, you know know what's weird is that the sheriff still goes and picks him up from prison and transports him. He's still in charge of transporting the man. I'm curious as to what's the argument that he's safer in prison because are you saying you're afraid of people breaking into the jail and hurting him? Then put him in a county over in another county jail. Yeah. Uh, You know, if you're worried about him being in that town and that people in that town that work in your jail can't be trusted because this case hits too close to home. Yeah. Put him in another county jail. Yeah. I mean, we've that's nearby. We've already been shown because I can't trust the, uh, What's it called? The DO um, Department of Corrections. No, clearly not. Yeah. That warden was allowing. Look what he was allowing. He with was the allowing, Odinus. yeah, gang related patches to be worn on a DOC official. And now face tattoos. Yeah. And now face tattoos. Which is unheard of. That is not normal. And, and all of this loses the sight of the victims and stomps all over everybody's freedoms, rights, civil liberties. It absolutely does. Um, I just, prison is notorious for hurting people who hurt kids. I, I, it is notorious. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Jails are not because they are specifically a place that's like a transition place, Mm -hmm. a place where you're serving less than a year or you're awaiting trial. It's easy for your lawyers to come in and talk to you and plan your case with you. Yeah. Like, I don't know how anybody could see this is anything but wrong. And again, more decisions on the judge. Like the person who was the deciding factor of this was the judge. Yeah. Um, and it, it again goes back to me not understanding this because look, let's just look at it from judge goals perspective for a second. If I'm judge goal and I have the insight to see the entire case and without a doubt, Richard Allen's guilty because there was a trail cam out there and it caught him on camera. Okay. How he's being treated right now is still not okay because we have to follow our, our, our rules and laws for our legal system. Yeah. He should still be in a jail. Yeah. Because you're still not allowed to railroad somebody, even if they are a hundred percent for a fact guilty, you're still not allowed to railroad them. And it doesn't make, he, it, he would or still be as them. disgusting. He would still be as guilty. We would still be able to convict him and put him where he was supposed to be. But we could do it the right way where like our justice system can hold their head high and uh, be respected. We're doing things in a way right now or that judge goal is where it's like in the shadows. It's gross. It feels dirty. It's disgusting. Um, I hope that she literally flushed her entire career down the toilet is what I hope. Well, you know, also McClelland, the prosecutor in this case, used to be a defense attorney. He literally defended his own father in an arson case where his father was an arsonist, um, which is interesting. And apparently he also comes from a lineage of Freemasons, which is also very interesting. Um, But he was a defense attorney. And went to be a prosecutor, which is not very normal. It's normally flipped. It's normally flipped. Yeah. 
But you would think with him having experience as a defense attorney, and if he's not corrupt and he's a good attorney who cares about the justice system, working for the people, finding true justice, which means the truth. Okay, the truth of what happened, the truth of who did it and holding that person accountable and keeping the public safe and getting justice for the victims and the families. Well, wouldn't you think he would look at this having defense experience and say, "Okay, Richard Allen isn't being treated right. What Judge Gull is doing is hurting my case. Yeah, I agree. She is destroying my case. I agree. I and, agree. And all the hard work put into it. Exactly. So yeah. why is he not speaking up? Why is he on her side? Yeah. And her on his. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. She's destroying all. your reputation, McClellan. Do you dummy? Yeah. She's destroying your case. This is one of those situations where I, I really wish the FBI were still in the case. Um, and, you know, e even when you're looking at some of the evidence on site there, like the the BLOD on the tree, um, l like I've seen a lot of people say, you know, that that could be anything that could be this, that could be that. But then at the same time, I look at the tree and like the bark is so rough. So what are you suggesting that somebody chose to wipe their hand like on that super rough crevice tree to like wipe it off? That would hurt and not be very effective. No, why wouldn't you do it on the grass or the ground? <laughs> or, or the, the river? Stream. The river? Yeah. That right will behind. wash it away? Yeah. That you already have clearly been to because they found clothes in it. Yeah, I know. I know. They clearly I washed things in that river. They put that on the tree for a reason. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I they say that this, the, the, the crime scene was staged. But here's the thing. Is that Richard Allen, unless he's involved in some dark web and he's like, a you know, knows all about the dark web, which there's no indication that he does at all. Um, there's no Internet history that he knows any Odinist, knows anything about Odinism, ever knew Libby or Abby or looked them up. He, there's literally zero connection to any of it. Yeah. That is not something you could just know. I didn't know anything about runes. I didn't know anything about like the Nordic religions other than what I watched on Vikings. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it doesn't show you runes and all that stuff. No. They just talk about Odin and Valhalla and they, you know, fight. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. But. Like, you don't learn all those things. Those things come from somebody who has either extensively looked into the practice of that Nordic pagan belief or practices it. Yeah. They had to have researched the practice or practiced it. Yeah. But, uh, and why would that be his intention to do that? To specifically stage it, to look like a pagan ritual. I have no clue. I, I don't think why not a satanic one. Satanic one would make way more sense for somebody who's no, you know what I mean? Maybe. I, I think either of them don't make a lot of sense. I, I don't know. I would have to have some connection to either of them. T to me, like one doesn't make more sense than the other. It all has to do with the background information that I would receive. I mean, if you're person. trying to stage it, yeah, if I, you are coming from you. America, yep. you're a hometown mm -hmm. kind of guy who grew up around Christianity, yep. staging it, if you're trying to make it look like some cult thing, staging it as like a satanic crime makes way more sense than me, but... Yeah. Well, I deflection so it to me it it could be either one it doesn't matter one one is just painfully obvious and uh, one just so happens were, to be there's a ton of those type of people in this area yeah 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 that he has no connection to right right but uh yeah hopefully we answered a few of your questions and if you have more questions on this story you guys i hope that you leave them below and let those thoughts riot uh I hope that we were able to lay it out. I know a lot of people have left comments that, hey, you know, I love your Idaho 4 content. I haven't had a chance to catch up on the Delphi stuff. So I hope we were able to break down like the basics of it, the who, what, where, and why, and like why this is so strange. But everything right now coming from the uh, the judge, everything right now coming from the prosecution and all the decisions being made are are 
outside of what anyone would consider normal. So, um, you know, I'd love to answer your questions further. So just leave them in the comments below. Definitely. So, um, a case that I saw breaking all over the place, um, this past week and a half has been the case of Audrey Cunningham, um, an 11 year old girl from Livingston, Texas, um, which is right outside of Houston, right? It was Houston. Yes. Yeah. So. Polk, Polk County. Yeah. So, um, she disappeared the day after Valentine's day. Um, she was supposedly being taken to school by a family friend, uh, but never made it to the bus. And apparently her family didn't know that went the whole day and she didn't come back home from the bus. And, um, they started going out and looking for her and couldn't find her. And an Amber alert was issued, I think around like 5 PM, um, that night. So, um, the last time she was seen was 7 AM and everyone was on the hunt, you know, looking for her and social media started popping off. Like the mother of this little girl, uh, we found out doesn't have custody of her and she was living with her father, grandparents, and a man named Don Stephen McDougal. This man, Don Stephen McDougal, is terrifying looking. <laughs> like he has Nazi tattoos all over him. Like I was trying to get closer images of his tattoos, um, trying to understand all of them. And there's many Nazi tattoos. Like everyone keeps pointing to the one on his shoulder, but he has other stuff on his chest that is like Nazi white supremacist stuff. Um, this man was living in a camper out back of her father and grandparents' home where they lived together. And apparently the mother has had her own troubles, but the reason she wasn't taking care of her is because she couldn't, she didn't have enough money. She didn't have the means to. And the father and his family were pushing the mom out of the girl's life. Talking about how horrible of a person she was and all kinds of stuff to the daughter and keeping her away, uh, keeping her at arm's length. Well, the day before Audrey disappeared, Stephen McDougal starts messaging the mom and saying that he wants to set up a meeting and that your baby has been asking about you. Um, And she's like, like, this is weird and wrong. It's Valentine's Day. She posted all this on social media, you guys, on her own behest. She wanted to put it out there. Um, but yeah, he says he's never disrespected for her. Uh, your baby's been asking for you. And she's like, look, this is messed up. This is weird. Like, what is going on? What? She's been asking about me. And he's like, sweetie, I'm as straightforward as it comes. If I was just talking to you to try to mess with you, I would have tried. She said, touche, I give you that. Um, she asked me if I, he's saying that Audrey asked him if she, he ever talks to her mom. And um, if her mom is as bad as her father tells him, tells her that she is. Um, and Gosh, so, so sad. I know. Um, I told her that you're doing good and are fun to hang out with. Uh, she asked me yesterday going to school. So apparently this guy babysits and takes her to school regularly. Um, oh, no. yeah. Uh, she's not allowed by herself outside in the evening. They told her that you are in the woods waiting to take her apparently. Um, she's confused about the situation, but I told her that you are not hiding in the woods, but we talk. Um, what is wrong with him? Is he on drugs and he, and stressed that his mental health has him thinking I'm going to steal her in the night. I live in the woods behind his mom's house. Like it's a horrible situation. Uh, and he basically tr sets up. Okay. 
that he wants to meet her at this lake, okay? And tries to set this up and says, like, don't worry. Like, because she's, like, really afraid. She's like, I don't want him to find out because then I, I'm, I won't ever get... I won't ever get her back. You know what I mean? Like, this will look really bad if, if you know, we meet up and, you know, all this goes wrong. Um, and he sa she says, I do not in any way need to be set up to lose my child even more. Lucky uh, would lose it if he knew. And is this what she asked you to do? I'm your daughter's favorite person and she will not tell is what he says. If I was the mom, I would be immediately so concerned. I'd probably call the cops. Yeah, I would call the cops immediately. Or what y'all maybe talked about for her to see me. She wants to meet you. I told her I'm on your team. I will do what I can. She, clearly, she's so desperate to see her daughter that she's like getting some kind of hope from this. And she's not reading the room, even though she feels weird about it. She's not understanding what's about to happen. Um, I think this is obvious. He's trying to set her up. Like if, if I set her up for the daughter to go missing so yeah, that she gets, blamed. so that she gets blamed for it. Mm -mm -mm. What doesn't make sense though. Okay. Is that the next day he never takes her to school. She never goes to the bus. And then he messages her. Have you seen her? Have you seen Audrey? So in the morning, he says, good morning. Uh, I hope I hear from her this morning. Please let her know if she changed her mind. It's okay. And then uh, later in the day, around 646 p.m., and that was early in the morning, uh, he says, hey, have you seen Audrey? I dropped her off at the bus and she didn't get on and hasn't gotten home. And she's like, no, Stephen, where the F is my kid? So if he was trying to set her up, like, why did he? Because they didn't meet. So a different avenue. Hmm. But I have lots of messages she's posted talking about the situation. Um, and there were so many people on Facebook after this started breaking of people coming out like this person, um, Carissa, saying, Stephen McDougal tried to R-word me when I was 10 years old. My parents were friends of his sisters. One night he came into my cousin's room where her and I were sleeping, ripped my cousin's clothes my cousin off the bed and tried to assault me. I was 10 years old. I remember running as fast as I could and hiding in the living room and watching him look around for me until he finally just went to bed. He is not a man who should have been around any children and I'm not the only victim. There are many people who have come forward talking about him. There's somebody who, a man who was at a party and he groped, he groped a married woman and the husband got in a fight with him. The The two guys at the party kicked him out. And then he came back with a knife. And was pounding on the door, stabbing it. And they went out there. And the guy had a gun. And he hit him in the face with a gun. And Stephen got in trouble for that. Like he had a warrant out for his arrest for that. But this guy was, he has a rap sheet like literally like 10 miles long. And he is a child predator and his charges show that. So why this man was allowed to live with a man who has a child and he was at a birthday party of one of Audrey's friend only like a week before this. <laughs> With how creepy this man looks and the fact that he has Nazi tattoos. Why is anybody letting this guy around their kids? He's literally, no he, idea. he gaslights him, he manipulates him and he sweet talks him. And some, for some reason they believe him. I mean, he needs to be the key suspect. So I hope he is. Oh, he's arrested. He's got capital murder charges. We because haven't even gotten this? to that. We haven't even gotten to that yet. Okay. 
This is like all throughout. She's missing. Nobody can find out what happened to her. People are saying he's a predator. Um, she tried to get him to let her talk to him. It makes me almost wonder if something didn't happen to Audrey that night. So he didn't end up going through with the plan to set the mom up because he couldn't help himself. Because I also have here um, that he was posting things to like swinger Facebook pages saying he's looking for a couple. Like he was literally on the prowl. Interesting. It's weird. On the prowl for what? Well, it, almost, it makes you wonder, like, was he trying to refrain from doing what his true desire was? Got it. And he, so he was looking for anything that was stimulating, like really sure. stimulating. So he's posting to Swinger, you know? Yeah. yeah. Just something outside of what ordinary. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Um. That's what I kind of think was going on, but it almost makes me wonder if something happened to Audrey sooner than that morning. And that morning was just maybe dumping her um, because unfortunately Audrey was found. Um, you know, at first they found her backpack and it was um, near here. I have a map here um, of where her home was and um where she was found and where they were searching throughout that time there was um it was grizzy's uh hood news right that's her name right i think remember so. um she was out there and there was other people out there and they actually were talking about the backpack being found they found a journal um that said send help written on one of the pages oh no uh but some people are speculating that that was him trying to set something up Yeah, Grizz with the mom. Grizzy. Hood news. Yep. yep. Grizzy's hood news. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> she, she was on scene, boots on the ground a lot of the time, which was awesome. That is amazing. Um, okay. So it's Lake Livingston. Um, and here's the map. You guys will see it. Um, it was pretty far from her house. I thought it said somewhere here. It was like, it was several miles away. Yeah. I don't remember how many miles, but it's a, it's a good distance. Like you had to drive there. Like, and that was one of the first things we heard initially was they were looking for his car, which was like, um, an SUV type car. I have a picture of it. This one right here. Um, so they put out the Amber Alert. They were like looking a for a 2003 dark blue Chevrolet. Um, and that was his car. And there were also pictures of him, like, talking to the cops, pointing down to the river. And he was arrested for the other charge of the assault, but was the main suspect. So they got him detained pretty quickly based on other charges. Good. Detained him. Great. And then they were out looking around this lake, around this area the whole time. And what we know now is that, okay, they found the backpack, they found those journals, and they found her pants on the riverbank. Um, and they were wet and that they took sonar out there in the water. Um, and they had cell phone pings. They tracked him because of his cell phone pings. And there were also spottings of him at a gas station um, in that car. There was also um, him at an auto repair shop earlier in the morning where he was really dirty. But they, they narrowed his area down that morning based on his cell phone pings. And there's a ton of towers in this area. We just looked and found that out right before I, we hopped on here. Um a whole bunch because it's right outside of the Houston area. So it's a ton. Like I'm sure it was pretty precise mapping yeah, where he probably. was. Um, and they s took sonar out there. And um, apparently the guy who did it, um, who was the expert in the, the sonar, you know, stuff, uh, he was on Nancy Grace's show. And he, he lost um, a child, unfortunately, that was murdered. And now that's his life. 
that's his life, um, you know, is doing sonar and, you know, water investigations like this. Um, he owns a company around it. And mm-hmm. he said it was so hard to find her. Like one minute she would be there and then one minute she wouldn't. And she was under the water and he had taken a rope and that rope had been seen only a couple days in his car when he got pulled over the same rope that he tied around her. When he got pulled over a few days before this, it was in his car and spotted by an officer. But he took that rope and a rock and he attached one into her and one into the rope and threw her in the water. Um, And apparently what the guy said, even though this is horrible to think about, that's the best thing he actually could have done for them to be able to find her. Because if he had not weighted her down, the current would have took her out so fast they would have never been able to find her. And she was down there swirling, so it was really hard for them to find her, like to see her with the sonar. Because one minute she'd be there, one minute sure. she wouldn't. But it's it's horribly tragic, and I can't help asking myself, like, why did this happen? Why was this guy on the streets? It reminds me of Davina Janeo, the guy that went to the mental hospital, was let out, and immediately went after her. Like, literally only, like, a couple weeks after being out. Yeah. I mean. It's a similar situation where this guy has a rap sheet. He's assaulted kids. He's not. I I think that the father. The that father, let too. the guy be around this, his child and uh, watch her and care for her in this way uh, needs to be held accountable. I, I agree. think he needs to be uh, handed, um, you know, um, whatever murder. uh like not conspirator, but um negligence. It needs to be not just negligence. I no. think it needs to be worse than that. I think it needs to be there's like uh, negligence. Can't they get him on like negligence and some kind of like manslaughter because of negligence? Um like second degree or something? Yeah, probably. Probably. Something like that. I don't know exactly how the charges would work. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. Wednesday night, he was trying to sell his car. And I found his Facebook account, you guys, and he had posted tons of things he was trying to sell. This dude was about to skip town. And he was posting these before he ever committed the crime. He was planning this. He was clearly planning this. And this guy apparently has plenty of ties to Aryan Brotherhood, okay? Meaning the dad probably does too. And I have a picture here. Look at that. That's the dad. That's Audrey's dad. And that's the guy, Stephen McDougal. They have matching headbands and bracelets. Oh, you can't see his bracelet in here. There's a bigger image where you can see the bracelet. FC. I wonder if that stands for some sort of like motorcycle motor. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure where this is taken. Yeah, I don't know and either, but this is... They were all going on family vacations together. This guy wasn't, like, a big part of their family life. Like, there's pictures of them literally traveling and going on vacations together. I, I'm just be, I'm just going to be fair here. If I had kids and I had somebody around my family that was, like, this engaged in this way, and they had a really weird tattoo that showed some kind of association with some gang, you know my... Within the first day that I saw that ink, I would be doing a background check, a paid background check. Agreed. And then if I saw that there was uh, child type stuff around there, bye bye, bro. Yep. See ya. It would probably be ring ring and then see ya, you know? Mm hmm. Because uh, you're not allowed to be around kids in that way. So, Um, but this is awful this is absolutely horrible it's disgusting um it's a shame it's one of those situations that yeah i think it could have been avoided and i think the father needs charges i they better charge the father uh oh i think at this point they could charge the grandparents too because i'm pretty sure the grandparents are the ones who actually had custody of her not the father yeah they all in that household should be i agree yeah, I and I've heard there's many criminals actually who were living at this house, not just him. Mm. 
So I, I don't know all that's truth and what's rumor or not, but he had a charge for enticing a child. Okay. He did two years and did not have to register as an offender, a sex offender. And this is a situation that he was grooming a child. There's a situation where he got in the bed and took off her pajamas. Like he has literally assaulted children, many children. Yeah. And is not registered as a sex offender and has not been held accountable in the way that he should. And his rap sheet, I'll have to put a picture of it up here for you guys because I'm not going to read off all the charges, but it's going back as far as the 90s to now, and it's long. Mm. It is a very long. Like, this guy is a menace to society. Look at that. Mm. Yeah. That is so long. It is. And it's so many things. Yeah. It and is. That's crazy. And it's really sad. It's really unfortunate. And it was really preventable. So many DUIs, so many resisting and avoiding arrest, uh, family uh, violence and stuff, assault, like the child stuff, so many things. He's literally a menace and a predator. Mm -hmm. And he should have never been anywhere near this little girl. Yeah. I you know, agree. I don't know what was going on with the mom exactly. All I know is that whoever put this child into those people's custody also has some accountability here. Yeah. Somebody like, didn't do the proper checks. No. Not at all. And you know what's another one weird thing I want to mention real quick is on what he has like six different Facebook accounts, you guys. Like he doesn't just have one like an Red or two flag. like a normal person. He has a ton of them. Red and they're flag. all legitimate from what I see. <laughs> well, he posted this picture in June 2018 saying a man is missing in his wife when his wife last saw him and asking like for people to be on the lookout and posting family pictures of them and they have three little girls and a little boy. He was involved in a missing persons case with children? Like what? It almost makes me question, did he do something to this guy so that he could be with the wife and the kids have and help access. them out, have yeah. access to them? Oh, no, man. Like, I just don't know what this guy it's is so willing to do. It's disturbing and gross. It's so hard to think about. These, these cases are really hard to think about, like the details of the crime and situation and stuff like that. It was really hard listening to um, the people who came on Nancy Grace's recent episode about this. Um, who were involved in this case. Um, it, I don't want to get into the graphic details like like she mm -hmm. likes to do because I don't feel like that's beneficial here. I think the real, what really matters is trying to prevent this in the future. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the fact that she had this guy living in her home, who knows, this was probably prolonged abuse. Okay, it probably wasn't just that day. It was probably prolonged. And the fact that somebody put her in those people's custody. I don't know what was going on with her mom, but it sounds like she would have been safer with her mom, even yeah. if she had less food to eat. Yeah. Better alive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like her mom clearly cares about her. Her mom is like destroyed by this. Of course. Like imagine not being able to take care of her, her living with these people and, and now she's gone. You don't get another chance. Yeah. And all Sad. because this guy wasn't registered the way he should have been for one. I don't care. You mess with a child once you go on a sex offender list. I agree. Period. It yeah. shouldn't matter what plea agreement. It, none of that should even be available to you to plea out of being registered. If you did something to a child. Yeah. I don't know. It's gross. Um, I think there, this clearly there needs to be something done to try to prevent this in the future, whether it's a harmonies law. I know it's hard. Like the child's gone. You'd rather have her here than have a law named after her. 
but we don't want something like this to happen again. And that's in Davina Janeo's situation in New Jersey. There was a string of killings like that where guys got out, committed these acts. Um, and, and that's why the sex offender registry is what it is today. Yeah. Well, clearly there needs to be some more improvements. Um, for me, that's not even the biggest deal. The biggest deal was the, the parent too. Out for her. Yeah, yeah, it is. And the school, you know, didn't even notify that she wasn't there that morning. They didn't notify it till like way later in the day. If I can find the single point that would have prevented everything, it's not the sex offenders list. It's not the school. It's the parents allowing shady people around this child. Yeah, but what can be done about that? What do you mean? They do not allow these types of people around a child. Yeah, I know that. Therefore, they need charges. Like, I call for charges for all of them. I agree. Yeah, the parents absolutely because should be charged. if the people that were caring for her would have kept criminals away, shady characters, looked into the background of people, and, and made sure this child's surroundings were safe and secure and trustworthy, guess what? None of the other things would have mattered. The, the sex offender list, yes, it all needs work. Absolutely, 100%. Um, but this is preventable regardless of whatever the state failed on that guy or not, if they would have managed this child like a respectable, you know, guardian should have. You're absolutely right. And I, I, I feel the same way. I thought I originally felt like I don't understand why the dad isn't being charged. I don't understand why the people who allowed this man in their home aren't being charged. Like it's totally your fault. Like along with his, like, you know what I mean? You're essentially an accomplice. You let a child predator criminal who has Nazi tattoos all over him in your house and allowed him to be her caretaker. I'm so curious what the connections are, like why he was there, you know, how many other people were, are they all a part of, a, you know, a skinhead gang or an Aryan brotherhood? Like, are they all a part of that? And that's why? I don't know either. Um, but this case was rough to listen to. I followed it from the beginning until she was found and all this was found out. Um, you know, I hope that she gets real justice and the people who all are should be held accountable are. Um, but I want to know what you guys think about it. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, you guys, that is the show tonight. That is Thought Riot Podcast, your favorite true crime and criminal culture podcast. And this is episode number 32, I think, 32 right? Yep. Um, it is. So just make sure that you do all the podcast things on all the podcast places, including the social media. Come hang out with us in discord. Come join our Patreon. We have a free tier too to get alerts and updates when we have new content coming out. We also have paid tiers, which have, uh, you know, different benefits to them. I would say the best place to become a member at personally though, is, uh, going to be YouTube just because it's the easiest place to watch the membership only true crime talk shows at the end of every uh sunday monday wednesday and thursday stream um so come join us come hang out and come have a good time with thought right podcast on the true crime talk show mm -hmm. and the members only after and my name is brendan and i am out bye, bye. we'll just hang out okay Thanks for being here. Bye.